I could just I could just tell in their faces. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to you go to a place and you could just see it in their face. They're overwhelmed with all of the orders that they yeah. already have, yeah. and they just can't keep up with this new influx of people. And I look at her face, and then I'm next, and she comes and she's like, um, "Just to let you know, it's going to be um, about thirty minutes, and um, some of the stuff that we have on the menu isn't going to be available." So I go, okay, I'm going to move on to the next one. I go on to the next one, and it's literally pre-packed sandwiches. <laughs> so I go, you know what? I'm about to walk to any terminal. I just start walking throughout the Phoenix airport, uh, at least a mile of walking, uh-huh. um, and finally found a Shake Shack. So I was like, all right, cool, I'm good. Uh, hey, guys, it's Mac and Black. You know what? Before we do all that, <laughs> you know what I you know what I can't stand, dude. I hate I hate when I'm at work and people insult my intelligence. Like today, this guy's like, "Yeah, uh, I like a pizza with Canadian bacon and 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 uh, pineapple." Okay. First of all, pineapple on pizza is <laughs> is beyond disgusting. You're not a fan of the Hawaiian? Hell no. Okay. Okay. No. It ain't even close. <laughs> but then I asked the guy, I was like, do you want barbecue sauce or red sauce? He's like, oh, I just want the red sauce. Then he goes, oh, you guys don't know how to make a Hawaiian pizza? I was like, you do know that a true Hawaiian pizza is made with barbecue sauce, right? Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, dude, don't come, in, don't come in don't come into restaurant and insult my intelligence. I don't like, I don't like customers like Hell that. Hell no. But... I have to deal with them almost every single day. I can't stand that. Yeah. And that's another thing, too. Yeah, dude. I'm, I've been on the other side of that glass when you just get straight up moped, like, the entire time. And then, like, by the time, you know, you want to reset and everything, mm-hmm. the line is just not going to die. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, my God. All these people are hungry. <laughs> Why is there so many people here? There's like five other restaurants. Is there cracking these pieces that we don't know about? So, dude, I, I can totally understand, which is why I'm not going to hate on the fact that you were there when those guys were overwhelmed because it happens to the best. Of yeah, and at the same time, I didn't want to be I, – I, I'm not the type to be like, this is your fault for doing it. I'm just not going to go. I'm, you know, I'm going to be like, you know what? I could probably find better food than this. So, uh, and, and there was some people who were like huffing and puffing. It's like, you know what, dude? You're in an airport. Like, just get get used to, uh, you know, eating – McDonald's shit food. Uh, you know they the, the airports have stepped up their game. But uh, anyways, That's hey true. guys, uh, it's Mac and Black. We're live at Reps thirty two hundred Rolling Meadows or Kirchhoff in Rolling Meadows. Uh, I'm watching UFC. That's why I was a little distracted. Um, and as you can see, I got um, I got caught slipping by the um, by the uh, first day here, guys. Sorry. We got you got you got it never caught. ends, dude. I it got never <laughs> ends. I got caught slipping by the uh, Girl Scout cookie uh, salesman out there, so uh, I had to go ahead and get me a couple women. Yeah, uh, they were uh, they were very enticing and uh, tag logs and uh, and uh, thin mints. You can't go wrong. Um, there's a lot to talk about in this show, in particular. Uh, obviously. We've got some NBA and NHL action uh, happening, but we're going to talk the reaction of Wilder Fury. Um, let's start. Let's start with that since yeah, that, that yeah. was kind of like the hot thing from last week. So Deontay Wilder. So we talked about how heavy um, Fury was coming in in the fight, and both of us. I, I I don't know about you, but I thought he came in too heavy, and then um, and then we saw the fight and. Fury was clearly the better fighter from basically the start to the end. Um, and, uh, and Wilder got hit with a couple of really nice shots. And his ear was bleeding, and there was like a couple of cuts there. Um, but he was mad that his corner had thrown in the towel, but they did throw in the towel. Um, and I thought it was the right move. Deontay didn't. He ended up fi- uh, firing his one of his cornermen um, because he said, I told him don't in any circumstance, which... That's a tough situation to be in as a corner person where you're like, I'm looking out for this person's safety, but I'm also having to deal with them being a competitive athlete. And, right. Um, and Deontay was very unhappy both after the fight and then, um, you know, some of the post fight stuff that he started talking and he, he he came out after the fight and was immediately like, I don't make excuses. He said all the right stuff after the fight. Um, but. Then in the post fight stuff, he was talking about his uniform, the 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 outfit he he had uh, put together for himself. 
Um, but at the end of the day, dude, he got dominated, and uh, and props to Fury. What what did you think of? I mean, obviously, Fury held down Wilder for most of the fight, and for that, most of the fight, that is really taxing. When a dude is forty pounds heavier than you, yeah, and you are getting basically grappled with every you know thirty seconds, um, it's it's tough. And and Wilder. He talked about them, the suit being 40 pounds, um, him having to wear it for up to 35 to 40 minutes. You know, there's people talking shit saying he went on Joe Rogan and, and said he trains with a 45, um, 45 pound uh, uh, vest. That's different. That's, yeah. that's, that's you working out. You right. know you're going to be sore after working right. out. Right. Um, but it's different going into a, a fight, you know. Right. So uh, there is legitimacy to what he's talking about. But my, my point is... <sighs> Your your people fucked up, uh, Deontay. They should have told you because he tried it on the night before. Yeah. You knew how heavy it was going to be, and nobody you didn't have anybody competent enough around you to tell you that that's not the move. First off, uh, I want to address a comment in the uh, in the uh, in the chat room, Andrew. We will talk wrestling, but I don't agree with you on the Goldberg thing. I think it's more genius. We'll get into that in a little bit. As far as the fight is concerned, I thought like okay. My first thought was, okay, Deontay could have just easily came out with a mask and called it a day. Yeah. Like, this isn't the, the mask WWE. Was dope as hell. It was this, dope. Yeah. This, this isn't the WWE. This isn't WrestleMania where, yeah. you know, you go all out with the interests and everything. You know, for you to use that as an excuse yeah. of why your legs were so weary towards the end of that fight, um, it's kind of a cop out. It is. Um, Here's what I think happened. I think what happened was the game plan that Deontay Wilder came in with was not a good game plan. No. And he just remotely just got his ass whooped for seven rounds. Yeah. Because, first off, let me say this about all the naysayers that say, well, I've been told you that Deontay Wilder's crap and blah, 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 and this and that. Dude, you don't go, what was he like, 40-something in O, and you're the WBC heavyweight champion of the world yeah. by accident. You know, I hate when people do that. Like, everyone will swear up and down, oh, he's garbage, he ain't this and that, uh, he was playing garbage competition, blah, blah, blah. Who you think Tyson Fury was facing the same yeah. thing, too? <laughs> Some it's random a, dude you, from you, Germany. You get what yeah. I'm saying? So... <clears throat> To all of a sudden sit here and try and crap on everything that Deontay Wilder has done after the after he lost to Fury is so stupid and, and, and it drives me up a wall. What I will also say though is Deontay Wilder got beaten by a more superior boxer than him. Yeah. Okay. Tyson Fury utilized his jab a lot and was getting through. Yeah. Deontay Wilder's biggest shots were not going through. And when they did get through, they weren't really phasing Tyson Fury. Yeah, he's got a chin, dude. He's got he, a chin. He definitely has a chin. Even yeah. though he may or may not have gotten knocked out in the fight before, yeah. he does have a chin. Deontay Wilder just got outclassed. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the whole throwing in the towel thing, he fired the trainer, but did I not read something earlier today that he brought this man back? Oh, I hope he did. That would be good. I, I hope he did because at the end of the day, dude, that's a lose-lose situation for that trainer, right? Like you can't really – there's nothing you can really do in that situation. First of all, his ear was bleeding. That is a well, really first serious. First of all, you got hit in the back of the head. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. There, I, I was, I was getting cut up by my barber. Shout out to Rico at Famous Fades. Um, I was getting cut up by my barber, and he showed me a video that one of his buddies showed him of some of the unorthodox ways that Fury was throwing his punches. Some of them were flicking his wrist. Yeah. It almost looked like his. Um, 
people were, were basically saying he was tampering with his gloves. I, I, I don't see that. I don't see him tampering with his gloves. I see what he does is he, he makes a concerned effort to hit you with weird, unorthodox, almost wristing shots. And right. It's, it's kind of crazy. And, um, and one of those wrapped around the head. And, and that, that's legal. At the end of the day, if, if you're transitioning as a defender in boxing and somebody hits you in the back of the head, that's, that's legal. There's, right. there's really nothing you can do about that. Tyson, like you said, he, he, he outclassed him completely. Uh, and at the end of the day, dude, let's be honest. Deontay is a freak puncher. Yes, he is. He is not a, a you know, a, a boxer that can say he can outclass somebody with fundamentals of boxing. Not really. I mean, the, the, the big thing. I think thing, he would even say No, that. he would. And he said it on Joe Rogan in the past and has said that basically he knows what his gift is. And that's, that's exactly why he was so upset that somebody had thrown in the towel because he felt like I have what I need to win this fight, which is my right hand. You just got to give me a chance. Now, the problem with that is when your ear's bleeding, it, it signals that you have a ruptured eardrum. Then your equilibrium is off. Your balance is off. There's really nothing you can do. If his ear was ruptured, which was what the thought process was, which it turned out apparently they did a test and it wasn't. Right. Uh, it apparently was just a laceration that all it needed was stitches and he was fine. So as a, as a, they're not doing tests on him in the middle of the fucking rounds. I right. mean, there's nothing you can really do to to, to figure that out. Uh, so I hope he did bring him back because that, that that's kind of a. I thought that was an overreaction. Uh, yeah, I thought, me too. I thought I thought he could have um, understood where the trainer was coming from in that circumstance. And so at the aftermath of all this, after you know we got the 12 million excuses from Deontay Wilder, he did invoke his uh, rematch clause. So there mm -hmm. will be a. Wilder versus Fury 3, that probably won't happen until I would almost venture to say... December, maybe? December, maybe, maybe 2021. They're saying they want to make a... They want to convince Wilder to uh, let him fight Joshua first, but he won't do that. No. Right? He's not going to do that. There's no And they've been ducking and dodging each other. Mm -hmm. When he was the heavyweight champion of the world, you know, Joshua yeah. went out right. and lost to Ruiz and then, you had know, to get it back. had to get it back. And then you would think that would have been the matchup. But Wilder wanted Fury again. And so I don't know, dude, whatever's going on between Fury's camp and Joshua's camp when it comes to those two guys has been ridiculous. But he hates Eddie Hearn, Eddie Hearn, who's um, Anthony Joshua's promoter. Uh, uh, Tyson Fury hates him, so he's he's going to make it difficult on them. So I'm I'm thinking because the problem is there's nothing wrong. Uh, Fury left that fight with no damage at all. Right, he only ate like two clean shots. Yep. That was really all he ate to the head. Otherwise, he looked like he didn't even go through a fight after the fight. Right, uh, and then finding out that Deontay's uh, injuries weren't serious, he only got I want to say I want to say it was a ninety day ban. I think, uh, which would mean that he could start training again in you know as as soon as like July or something like that. What is this February? It's, it's March, February. April, it's May. March right so now. About June, July ish. Yeah, and and <clears throat> the thing is, maybe they'll tell him wait a month and. Until you know you start training again, but all you really need is three months to train. So I, I I think I think at the end of the day they can make it happen before the end of the year. They should, otherwise you're holding up the division. Right, 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 right. So I thought it was an entertaining fight. I had put a couple of I was actually door dashing as the fight was going on. Mm -hmm. So I was watching it and door dashing at the same time. And I'm like, dude, the champs in trouble, the champs in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next thing you knew. The towel had been thrown in. Deontay's just eating shots left and right. He became meme central. I think that's what happened. His his yeah. ego, his ego then got uh got bruised once and not go new. <laughs> and once you go viral, it's over with it. He just became meme central. But I think for Fury Wilder three, uh, uh, what's his name? Wilder has to come with a better game plan. He has to come in heavier too, and uh, he's got to come in heavier, heavier, stronger. You, you can't you can't win like that in the heavyweight and and have the uh, a guy like Fury. I was worried, and I don't know about you, but I was worried that he came in too heavy. Right. I, I thought that that was excessive. Apparently, what they said was like ten of those pounds was water weight, yeah. and all he had to do was basically just get you know get off the water, and he was good. So I I, I don't know. No, man, I all I know is I don't think it really mattered in that matchup. I think 
you saw that Tyson was just a better boxer, and um, and he he was hitting him with shots that were unblockable, undefendable. And at the end of the day, I think Tyson is going to go down as one of the best stories in all of sports. You know, it's pretty crazy to look at him uh, a couple of years ago at 350 pounds and then see him now. Is uh, is Amanda the lady that's selling the cookies right here outside of the what you call it? Because she showed just commented and said she yeah, sees the cop Amanda, cookies and thank you thank for the you. support. Thank you. Your girls, so. your girls were amazing, and I had to buy from them because you know. And uh, my, my, my PSA <laughs> to the GSA: make keto friendly cookies, and I will buy them. <laughs> yeah, they're, they've stepped up their game with the credit card stuff. So you know, step up your game with the yeah, keto. Uh, yeah, know? you know, I know it's baby steps, we'll but you it. know, but the keto game is hot and. I want some. I buy cookies. It's just you know. <laughs> well, Amanda, thank mean. you, thank you. Yeah, Your girls are adorable it. and they're great uh, saleswomen. So I'll I'll buy from them anytime they're here. Yeah. So let's get into some. I, I want to get into wrestling, but Mike's not here because I can't. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, I'm, getting, let's, I'm, getting, I'm getting comments up the wazoo because everyone's so if mad. If you guys are waiting for wrestling talk, usually we get to wrestling talk about an hour and a half in oh, when Mike when Mike gets uh, gets here because Mike's a big wrestling fan. So just uh, bear with us. We're going to talk some some yeah. other sports, but we'll get to wrestling because because sure. Steven's mad if if Re Roman Reigns wins the belt against Goldberg at WrestleMania, he's going to be mad, <laughs> and then uh, everyone's so upset that Goldberg won the title from boring ass Bray Wyatt I know it's terrible that's wrestling dude that's but we'll we'll get into it later because I actually like the I, I'm, I like the fact that they took the title off him so but we'll get into that later but let's get into the NFL real quick because okay. so yesterday I would say I got the notification on my phone it had to be like 7 7 30 because I was door dashing when I got it mm-hmm that Tony Romo had signed a big time deal worth $17 million a year to stay with CBS. Mm -hmm. We knew that Tony Romo was going to get a huge deal, whether it be from CBS, whether it had been from this huge ESPN. mega deal from ESPN. But I, when I saw it, I was like, you know what? If I'm Tony Romo, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe ESPN was offering him more money, which is cool. Yeah. But if I'm comfortable with CBS and I'm comfortable with Jim Nance and I don't have to take any more of a workload than what I'm doing, I just rather stay where I'm at yeah. and I have to change networks and change homes and change this and that. And it's not like Tony Romo's fishing for loot. No. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the man got paid nice pretty <laughs> heavily as the starting, you know, quarterback for the Cowboys for so many years. Um, and, and let's let's be honest, Nick. Um, the uh, the whole the whole ESPN gig is way tougher than the CBS gig. Right. The CBS gig, you just show up and you do the game and the post game and the pregame. Right. With ESPN, that's that's a seven day a week job. Yep. You're doing radio. I mean, how many times do you hear Booger McFarlane on the radio? And then you know he's on ESPN. Joe Tessitore. Joe Tessitore. And, and then you got to do the Will Kane show. And then yeah. you got to. And now you got to do first take. Yeah. And now and you then. went from basically working a three day a week job at CBS to working a seven day a week job. And and ESPN. Let's be honest. They're not known for being employee friendly. They right. work those. They work those dudes hard. Yeah. I mean, Kirk Herbstreit gets paid, but people don't realize that. Kirk Herbstreet is flying across the country uh, Friday through Monday uh, for ESPN the whole season in college right. football. So right. uh, that's a tough job. And, and props, to, props to Tony, but my problem, and I'm sure this was what you were bringing up, was the same problem of Michael Thomas, yep. who was very vocal about this, and plenty of other players had had echoed these sentiments early in the week, not necessarily about Tony Romo, just about the – disparity between how much the players are getting paid in this situation uh, uh, versus pretty much everyone else in the operation. And it right. was it was basically like an 80-20 thing. Right. They feel like that's disproportionate, and I agree. I mean, if you got a guy getting paid by CBS $17 million, um, you know, I think we can afford to, and that's just basically talking, you know, for 18 weeks or whatever, right. 20 weeks a, a year. Right. So I, I don't know, man. I, I agree with it. There's got to be a way to make everybody happy here. Um, and, and I really think at the end of the day, the billionaires uh, that are the owners 
are are playing a little bit of a shady game right now and making the players look bad as if they don't want and oh my god the players are you know they don't apparently they don't want to play and everybody's talking about how you know there's a silent dissent within the players that if they don't get what they want they, they're they're not going to play this season and uh, I don't think it's going to get to that point I think billionaires understand what leveraging is and they're just going to continue to try and leverage themselves into a better situation here's my thing too because <clears throat> I think the greatest point that was really made out of a lot of this came from the mouth of oh which pouncy was it um i know they're twin brothers maurice pouncy yeah I think, maurice pouncy uh -huh. where he went on to whether it was facebook live or one of those lives yeah. and he said let me tell you the difference between these nfl players mm -hmm. and the players before yeah we making 65 70 million dollars just on our signing bonus mm -hmm. we got bread yeah so you think you locking us out is going to hurt us if we smart like they've been saying they've been doing. And it sounds like there's really not that many people per se, especially your higher paid people mm -hmm. that have this bread where they can sit out and lock out. Yeah. This going to hurt the owners more than the players. Yeah. You know, and, and again and again, this is where the owners, I understand that by playing a 17th game. Mm hmm. It's supposed to generate two to four hundred million dollars in revenue and all this other nonsense. Yeah, that, that, that I don't care about that either. Like that's you know. my problem. Yeah, the the players have a or not the players, but the owners keep having this bad habit of wanting to listen to the fans. Right. Stop listening to the fans. They don't know any <laughs> fan that keeps saying, "Oh, the preseason is so long. Uh, where did it be four weeks? Uh, the preseason ain't for you, Pippin. Just you know what watch. the preseason yeah. is for? It's for diehard fantasy players. It's for um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the dynasty fantasy players. Yeah. It's for the fantasy players that are looking for that sleeper. 18, in, in, those 18 to 20 team leagues. I'm, you, I'm in a 16 you, team you league. You feel what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, you're watching. That's preseason. what you need. Yeah. America has this bad habit of wanting to be so desperate for football. Yeah. It's got to start earlier. Oh my God, like I will never in my life be so desperate for football that I'm taking a day off to watch the Hall of Fame game. Yeah, yeah. But that's where we've come to sure. when we haven't had football for so yeah, long. Yeah. You know, we're so desperate for football, someone will message me and be like, Nick, are you watching a Utah State against Colorado oh, yeah, State? No, 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 I'm not no. because I'm not that thirsty for football. Like, I'll know when, when, when I'm ready to watch it, mm -hmm. especially when I know that the New York Yankees okay. – are are about to go out for championship number 28 yeah football's the last thing i'm thinking about yeah so if the owners for five minutes will stop listening to the big head ass fans yeah just like the wwe has as of late has stopped listening to the big head ass fans maybe we could get somewhere because the 17th game in the nfl is dumb i'll never support it i'll yeah. never understand it and i'm with the players dude Unless you're gonna pay us, pay us millions of dollars in this revenue share, which I'm sure you're not. The 17th game doesn't make. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Why are we fixing it? We I, don't need to fix it. I love that you said stop listening to the fans because that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. A bunch of idiots talk. Like I, I saw a bunch of comments on uh, that. You know how there's always sponsored posts on Facebook, and I saw a sponsored post from like some. I think it was like almost one of those Comcast Sportsnet Wisconsin things. And there was a bunch of comments saying, Aaron Rodgers makes $30 million a year. What does he know about struggle? And, and what people don't understand is, you know, these players are just representatives of their whole team, the whole roster, all of the players, the th however thousand, you know, play amount of players that are in the uh, in the NFL pool. Um, they're representing them. And, and these negotiations are not for the top half of the roster. They're for the top bottom of the roster um, or the bottom half of the roster, ra rather, um, because at the end of the day, the, the 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 most uh you know the highly paid players are gonna be fine um but the players that are really you know gonna be struggling for this are the ones who are gonna get an injury in that 17th game right and they're never gonna be the same and, right. and you're gonna have that and it's unnecessary at the end of the day I, I think we're gonna find a compromise here like i said i think everything's a little bit overblown in the media right now uh it's a little bit too soon to start freaking out we're, we're we haven't even touched the draft yet uh and and i, I 
would imagine that you'll see, you know, we'll, we'll see some sort of, uh, um, you know, waiting here uh, in the next couple of weeks. And then we'll start to see negotiations uh, that I think will get a little bit closer as we're watching the Blackhawks and, and Panthers. As I well actually as need you guys to win this game. Yeah, you um, do? Okay. Let me see. Andrew says the issue with preseason now is that the stars don't play at all and they aren't in shape when the real game starts. Whose fault is that? And why do you want to go to a preseason game, my man? Just wait. Just right. wait. I mean, people people complain about, first of all, the tickets to the Bears games are like $25. For preseason? For preseason. Mm-hmm. You're going because nobody's playing. That's why those are cheap. That's why you're going. And, and yeah, fine. If you want to go, go for that. But don't complain about the players, dude. Again, you have to understand that this is not for you, my man. This is not for your entertainment. Preseason no, is for preparation. I am. A, you know what I'm a proponent of, Nick? Stop televising them. Just it, make it like spring training. If you don't, and and for some reason, um, MLB owners they love to nitpick about millions of dollars for their players, but yet they want to leave millions of dollars on the table by not televising some of these baseball games uh, that are in spring training. It's stupid. I understand you want people to go to these spring training games, but you are they're already sold out every single time. I mean, right. people love those trips. There's people who make those trips every year. I was just in Arizona, and my. The distribution center that I work with, uh, we're used to we're used to our busy season starting in June. Their busy season starts in February. And he says the reason for it is because of spring training. It's nuts. the The restaurant business goes nuts when it's spring training is around because people go to spring training. So uh, you know we have to understand that you know uh, preseason for for your entertainment is is if you are a super fantasy freak, if you're a a, a football you know just nut. Or or if you're somebody that you know, like us, who wants to pay attention, like I, trust me, dude. If it's if it's Thursday night and I got nothing else going on and I'm on the couch, and I'm, fold- and I'm folding laundry, I'm gonna be watching a preseason game, and I'm not even probably gonna be watching. It's just gonna be background noise. I'm gonna watch it. If something happens, I'll notice and I'll go, oh, cool. You know, somebody scored a touchdown. That's it. But otherwise, dude, who cares? It's not for you. Let them have it and let them be able to practice so that they can, you know, have a good season. If you're a Bears fan, uh, then and you should understand how important preseason is because our team didn't play in preseason this year. Um, and I'm, t- I'm not even talking didn't play when they were supposed to. No, they didn't play. Period. You know, period. You have to have at least two games. What is it? The, the, the sentiment is the first game, nobody plays. The second game, if they do, if they it's, do it's, it's like one, one maybe two series at best. The second game, you get. A, a quarter, rest, yeah, a quarter yeah. maybe. Third game is the dress rehearsal. Is the dress rehearsal. And then fourth game is don't you don't want to play because you don't want to you've already gotten the reps that you need, right? right. That's the whole point of it. Uh, so at the end of the day, dude, I just want to go back to where we don't have to worry about this bullshit. Like really I'm honestly, man, I just want to be done. This CBA CBA negotiation should be a lot easier than they are in all sports. Andrew says, I agree it's for preparation, but how are they preparing by not playing? They are being overprotected. I want the best out of these guys when it, when it matters, and they have to play to prepare for that even just a little bit. But again, okay, bro, this is how I'm looking at this. This is a double-edged sword because some of it is the team and some of it is the regulations that have been put mm-hmm. down on them. You know, you got for for as much as I agree with you, you have to look at some of these guys like what is it Bryant McKinney that died from a heat stroke from yeah. playing it like like they're they're bringing out where now it's it, like you you have I what did I hear on Waddle and Sylvie one day where it was like they went down from two a days Rest to days, one a yeah. days and now you can't even wear pads in practice yeah. until like the third week of you being in training camp, and you can only be out the there for so four many weeks, hours. First four weeks have to and be padless, right? And, and that's yeah. the NFL protecting its its investments because, Absolutely. okay, it's like for instance when Tom Brady went down the year that he uh, Rodney Harrison went into his knee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know and, how hard it is to try and market oh, New England dude. games oh with, with no Matt Tom Castle yeah. as your yeah. starting quarterback? Yeah. That stuff's not easy. Yeah. Like, nobody, no offense, even the best offensive lineman in the game, nobody goes see. Like, like, when Joe Thomas was in the game, 
I'm pretty sure Browns fans were like, dude, just take a look on how yeah, graceful keep, keep Joe Thomas Keep an eye Thomas on is. Joe Thomas. Right. Me, let's, yeah. let's take a look at how great Joe No. Yeah. Everyone's going to talk about, oh, I want to see Odell, or oh, I want to see, uh, uh, what's the other fool, the quarterback, Baker Mayfield. Oh, I want to see ABC or Lamar or this and that. Yeah, no one's going to see offensive linemen. So the NFL has to protect the investment. Plus, the NFL is not trying to get sued yeah. when guys die of heat stroke. Because we're out there running them in full pads when yeah. they maybe don't need to, you know. So and, and I think you're looking at this wrong, Andrew. First of all, there's 53 players on a roster right. that are going to make it. How many players do you start with in training camp? 90 At sometimes? least 90. Sometimes. sometimes 90, up to 90 players, Andrew. So you have to keep into consideration that you're talking about star players. Why aren't they playing? Well, because we know what we have in this guy. Right. I don't need to play him in preseason right. to understand who he is is i know who he is in practice and in the game i need to know about th these other 53 guys that probably aren't going to see our team later to see if they should make our team so right. uh, what you're talking about is 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 not just simply not valid because you need that preparation uh i think the system that we talked about the first game being you you play a series here the second game you play a little bit more the third game the dress rehearsal the fourth game i think it's a perfect system it's an it's worked for a long Long time. How long have we been talking about this system, Nick? Since since almost the '80s, since they've been basically doing this sort of same little routine in in the uh, in the uh, preseason. It works. Right. It gets these players ready. And at the end of the day, I'm a fan of 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 the some of the safety regulations that, that have been put into place. We need that. We can't constantly have injuries in the preseason. And you already see it, Nick. Let's be honest. Even with all the safety regulations they put in, how many times do you see second day of, of OTAs Somebody tore something. There's and guys out for the there's year. There's guys torn out for the year. So, you know, these are the types of things you're trying to prevent. Teddy Bridgewater. Teddy Bridgewater. I mean, free uh, accident in practice. In preseason games, I mean, you, you, there's so many times uh, that, that you have uh, an overzealous guy who's going to be a third stringer who's really trying to make an impression, and he throws himself at the knees of somebody, and somebody gets hurt because you have an idiot in preseason who doesn't know how to play in preseason. Right. It's It's... It's not for your entertainment. Turn the TV off and move on. Um, so we're, we'll keep our eye on this CBA. I think I think the owners and the players are going to be fighting for a while. They're going to go back and forth. But something tells me I think they'll figure something out where the owners will get a little bit more bread without the the players damn near killing themselves for them to do it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad I brought up Teddy Bridgewater's name. And you, first of all, thank you to Future everyone Buccaneer. that's, that's – uh, <laughs> I, I hope to God that doesn't happen. <laughs> Do, do not I, I swear I swear on my AKA life if James I see Winston Jr. if I see that Teddy Bridgewater has signed some lucrative deal to go to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, oh, man. I will be so incredibly pissed. Why, I'm dead why? ass serious. Okay, let me let me let me let me try and break this down because okay. maybe maybe I'm missing something, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I was having an argument about this. In no way, shape, or form is my opinion on Teddy Bridgewater have anything to do with how I feel about what's going to happen with Jameis Winston. Okay. Okay. But this is what I don't understand. Teddy Bridgewater is 22 and 12 as a starter. I give him that. However, I like to look at the what have you done for me lately aspect when it comes to Teddy Bridgewater's career. Mm -hmm. So Teddy Bridgewater had the freak accident with his knee. Missed damn near a year and a half. Comes back into uh, preseason with the New York Jets. And Teddy Bridgewater did such a great job beating out Josh McCown. And I can't think of the other person for that New York Jets job. Sat there in third string that he got traded to the New Orleans Saints where he's just been bench warming behind Drew Brees. Yeah. So then he comes out and everyone's like, oh, man, Teddy Bridgewater looked really great in those five games that he won for, for Drew Did Brees. He no, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. That defense was standing on its head looking yeah. amazing. Latavius Murray was literally taking carries away from the great Alvin Kamara yeah. uh, because, uh, for whatever reason, Kamara forgot how to run the ball between the tackles, and Murray never forgot. It had nothing to do with Teddy Bridgewater. No. Even in the game where the where the Saints beat the Bucks in New Orleans, Teddy Bridgewater didn't look that great. No. And let me tell you this, too. If if certain teams will just learn how to uh, 
uh, defend Michael Thomas, the Saints wouldn't be as great as they are <laughs> yeah. because Michael Thomas is the sole reason why the Saints offense looked as great as they did. Yeah. There's not a second string wide receiver on that team. Ted Ginn has been garbage and catching the ball his entire career, and he gets paid on speed. You couldn't even tell me who the third string wide receiver for the New Orleans Saints <laughs> is because it's irrelevant. Yeah. Dude, Teddy Bridgewater is fool's gold. He's fool's gold. And every Buccaneers fan that keeps going around crying, thinking that Teddy Bridgewater is this almighty savior that's going to help the Buccaneers out in their quarterback situation, is a total joke, and I'm sick of hearing his name about it. Dude, as much as I don't want to hear Tom Brady's name when it comes to it, there's a great chance that somehow I think Tom Brady ends up in Tampa Bay. I really do. Wow. And I also think that the Buccaneers are even going to make a bigger splash in the draft because that segues into what I saw in the quarterbacks in that combine because Justin Herbert right now just put himself easily as 1A, 1B, and 1C in the quarterbacks. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even insult him by saying he's the third best because we already know that Joe Burrow consensus is going to be number one. Mm -hmm. And Justin Herbert, the way he threw that ball at the combine, those D passes were money. Mm -hmm. Pure money. Money. It wasn't, it wasn't, oh, he led him too far to where the wide receiver had to try and catch it. Yeah. It wasn't he underthrew it to where the receivers had to make an adjustment. It was bread, it was straight butter, all his throws. And his body almost looks like a quarterback oh already, God, too. You look dude. at him and you're like, wow, you already look like an NFL quarterback and you haven't even played a game yet. Oh, I got some, you know, I go on rants. And then uh, Brian says, Bridgewater beat us, that bastard. Yeah, dude, whatever. They didn't go with Bridgewater. They went with Sam. Dude, he didn't even make second string. That's my point. Dude, the Jets are not that good of a football team. No. But how is a guy who couldn't even get on the second string of the New York Jets gets traded? Yeah. Come on, man. And then, and then, if you were that good, you could have beat our old ass Josh McCown right. to get to at least to the second string in case things don't work out with Sam Darnold or he gets hurt. Yeah. Like, and come on, New Orleans dude. has been playing with him too about the whole well, I mean, you never know if Drew if Drew leaves, we might bring you back as the franchise quarterback. And I feel bad for the guy because they've been kind of putting it in his head that he's a franchise quarterback and he's not. I mean, let's let's be honest, Nick. I mean if if you have a franchise quarterback, you know it. Like, let me just tell you. Let me give you a couple examples. Daniel Jones just got drafted. What what was he? Number five? five? Six. Not five, 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 five. Five overall by no, the— uh, No, 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 six. Because six, the Bucks okay. drafted at five. Yeah. Uh, six overall last year. The Giants are saying they're not going to rule out taking a quarterback in the first round. Right. Um, you have Baker Mayfield getting drafted first overall in a in a quarterback heavy draft. Yes, and now the Browns have to really be thinking: Do we actually have a franchise quarterback? You're seeing it with Mitch Trubisky. You're seeing it all over the league. There's not yep. a lot of these guys left. That's why it's so crazy to me to see Bucks fans be so against the Jameis Winston coming back because you don't see that level of success all the time and when you do see it it's noteworthy now it's also noteworthy that he has some 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 shortcomings in that as well but sometimes you have to take the good with the bad and sometimes you have to understand that there's the grass isn't always greener sometimes you have to you know pick your battles i like i like the the lack of commitment from arians of basically saying i don't care um, because that leaves the options open, right? Yep. Uh, it would be almost the opposite of what the Bears have to do because you have to give confidence to Mitch Trubisky. You have to, like, see... First of all, if you're Ryan Pace, you already fucked up. You already made the decision. You you, you drafted the guy. You might as well support him and, and go down with him if he goes down. So a lot of Bears fans are mad. You know, people want to see a trade for Dalton. People want to see us go after Rivers. I mean, that's not going to happen, guys. So let's Let's be honest with each other. It's not going to happen. And they're talking about like Cincinnati's putting a second round uh, uh, draft pick 
bounty on on the head of Andy Dalton if you want to go out there and get him. It's and, not worth and it. And you're going to have to pay him because the whole reason they don't want to go through the whole process of the cap hit of of his contract. So, I, I don't know, man. I, I first of all, I know the Bears don't have money for that right now. They've already uh, cut Prince of Mucamara and Ty, uh, Taylor Gabriel. Um, you know, that those were very obvious ones, you know. The only other ones that that could be obvious um are Leonard Floyd, you could free up 13 million with that, but apparently they don't want to do that. So, you know, th that's the thing about the salary cap. You've got to be careful. The Bears are in salary cap hell right now, and we don't have a lot of options. We're, if we're going after someone, it's going to be going after someone on a team-friendly contract and, you know, hoping that somebody that can back up and maybe win the job for Mitch. Brian, who's a diehard Bucks fan, say he'll take, he'll take Brady. Uh, Andrew said, yeah, I, I, am, too. <laughs> I am glad the Jets never played Bridgewater. Uh, I never thought he was all that good anyway. I'm 100% on you with that. Uh, Brian says, sign Brady and draft uh, uh, Justin Herbert. I'm I'm I, I'm actually almost all for that. Wow. And if it's not, if it's not, if that's the route Tampa goes, like, to be honest with you, and I said this on my Facebook the other day, I'm just, I just hope that something comes up because I'm kind of over the fighting with the bring James back versus the we don't want him anymore nonsense. Um, I'm over Bruce Arians really making these passive aggressive comments when it comes to Jameis. I think they're stupid uh, any way you look at it. Um, if the Bucks are really serious about bringing in Tom Brady, they have to draft somebody in the first round. And I bring up Justin Herbert. He looked good. Jalen Hurts really looked good. And the kid from Utah State, um, Jordan Love. Mm. He was shaky a little bit at first, but a lot of people think that there's a lot of upside to this kid. Almost Lamar Jackson-esque, a guy, a kid that could slip to the end of the first round. You could make a deal to bring up with him. And if you have an established quarterback, here's a kid that could sit behind uh, an established quarterback knowing that their foot is on the way out of the door. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, you could bring him in when you're ready. So I thought quarterbacks day, day one, there's, I mean, like I said, there's some things that's going to happen and Tampa Bay needs to figure it out because it sounds like that they're going to use their franchise tag on keeping Shaq Barry. Oh, so that means how much that, is that? Do you know? I'm not sure. I'm I didn't gonna, see the numbers, that up, but that's, I, uh, that's gotta be high with all the edge rushers. Yeah. So, I mean, but the bucks have a lot of salary cap. So, oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, uh, Berman or Andrew says Kansas City is an example of a team who knew as they traded up to get Mahomes, they knew that that was their guy. Their scout, Andy Reid, had admitted that there that he wasn't really looking into Mahomes, but their scout was telling him, "Do you have to trade up and get this kid? He is absolutely going to be an absolute stud for you. Yeah. I'm high on him. I will almost put my job on the line if he doesn't work out. This and that. And obviously, this guy knew what he was talking about. As and Mahomes and, is coming off a Super Bowl win and an MVP. And knowing what you know. Can, can you just put this to bed for me? Knowing what you know, if Mahomes was selected by the Bears, does he work out exactly like this worked out? No. 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 It, it, just because you selected the right guy doesn't mean you're getting this guy. You know, what, what Mahomes did this year is a cultivation of the last three years with Andy Reid sticking with his game plan, drafting yeah. this guy, sitting him, letting him play at the end of that season, two games at the end of that season, and you saw, it was crazy, uh, it, you saw in Patrick Mahomes already in the two games he played in, in that previous season that he was going to be a very good player. And then he came out of nowhere in that, in that second year, and, and this, and, and last year he had a good season, it's just that he fell apart in the playoffs. Right. And now this year, you're seeing the cultivation of, 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 of Andy Reid, the GM, the coaching staff, all of the scheming they've done has done terrifically for Patrick Mahomes. Congrats to them. But if you're a Bears fan and you're thinking, why didn't we draft? We could have had him and it would have been, we would have been in the Super Bowl. No, that's not how that works. Ask yourself this question. Do you honestly think that with Allen Robinson, Trey Burton, yeah, <laughs> uh, Adam Sheen, uh, yeah, even like Tariq Cohen, like the with these Taylor guys. Gabriel. Then who's the one that I picked up that crapped the bed Anthony against Miller. <laughs> Anthony Miller? Yeah. Do you think that Patrick Mahomes would have had the same success no. with those guys? No. no. Do Allen Robinson could have probably been in the same, not so much breaking the catch record, yeah. but being in the same record, um, same sentence as uh, 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 Michael Thomas, yeah. But then, dude, the drop-off 
God dang it, Crawford, 128. Couldn't make one more save. Sweet Mama Cedar. 2-2, two, two, Florida in Florida. Um, you're going to tell me that you could have had the same results. No, the drop-off is bad. Think about it. Uh, my buddy Rob brought up a very good point where Andy Reid – Andy Reid has always been a guy that has surrounded his quarterbacks with speed. Yeah. He did it in in um in Philly. Philadelphia. Yeah. And you're seeing it now. The Bears don't have speed. Anthony no. Miller is not a speed demon. Taylor Gabriel has lost a step. Um and, and, and uh, honestly, you don't even know if Tariq Cohen, that whole gadget thing would work with, exactly, with him. It, it's, it's 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 a complete moot point. And at this point, if you're a Bears fan and you're frustrated about Mitch Trubisky, I understand that. But you have to have a little bit more creativeness than just, oh, what if we drafted him or what if we did it's over, dude. Get over it, man. We've got to we've got to figure this out this year. Uh Mitch Trubisky may or may not be the future of the of the of the Bears. If he is good, if he's not, then we'll we'll move on when we move on. But uh, clearly, right now the Bears are going to be looking at quarterback. They're they're gonna they have to they have to. We don't have Chase Daniel, so they're going to be looking at a, at a quarterback. We just don't know of what caliber quite yet. I've been I heard the name of Marcus Mariota being flo- floated out. They're I like thinking, that. I like they're that. thinking that Marcus might actually fit In, what uh, Nagy, Nagy wants Nagy, to do yeah. better than Mitch. Yeah, you know, and and I think you I, I would almost entertain it just for the simple fact of. Maybe a fresh start for Marcus Mariota is what he needs. Yeah. You know, I don't think he's that terrible of a quarterback. I mean, no. let's not let's not act like this man didn't take the Tennessee Titans into he did something against Kansas City uh, yeah, that yeah. Ryan Tannehill didn't do, and that's beat the Chiefs at home mm-hmm. in the playoffs. Yeah. Okay, so this man's no slouch. I mean, I think he just has fallen on some hard times and fell out of love in Tennessee. But you're going to tell me that a fresh start wouldn't be good for a guy like Marcus Marion? I think yeah. it would. So I think the Bears might want to entertain that. I think the Bears and the Bucks are in similar situations where with their quarterback, there has to be a challenge point. Mm-hmm. Like with Jameis, you have to challenge this man to let him know that if all the, if these turnovers don't, don't turn around, mm-hmm. we'll pull the plug on this extra quick and you won't see the field again. Yeah. I think the same things with Mitch. It's, it's not... It's at a time now where like everyone's saying that the defensive window is closing so if you need to go out there and find somebody that is at the minute that what's his name is struggling you got the, somebody to put you got right somebody away. to yank out and put him right away so these guys got to get challenged at some point and you know i i'm just against the bears giving up on mitchell who's 23 as much as i'm against the bucks giving up on Jameis as 25 but something needs to happen up here pretty soon and it's a results oriented league nick we know this. exactly you know you've got to exactly. you've got to have the results everybody was in love with the thought of mr trubisky after last year uh uh or the year before i guess now um uh everyone was infatuated with oh my god mr trubisky i mean i remember a video specifically from a guy who does a great job matt miller he does a good job for on the bears beat uh but he was he put together like a 13 minute video of all of the throws that proved that mr trubisky is uh, a franchise quarterback and all the throws are Looked really good. He he made uh, Mitch put some tape together uh, in 2018 that made you go, you might have something here. Right. And and everyone was thinking that. And then what happened was that I remember that first year or that first game against the Packers, and I remember sitting there with my buddies watching and thinking. This isn't that guy. Right. This isn't him. He doesn't know what he's doing right now. He's not able to make reads. Um, That's the thing that impresses me most about guys like Mahomes. Not the sidearm throws, not the crazy circus stuff. You know, he knows how to play quarterback. He knows how to read defenses. He's already smart in that way. He understands extending plays. You know, he understands the intricacies of the quarterback position that sometimes you can't teach that. You know, there's going to be a time where you're going to look at Deshaun Watson and you're going to look at Patrick and you're going to look at some of the obviously Lamar Jackson um, and you're going to start to go, what is the one thing that they all have in common? And and one thing is that they all have the athleticism that get themselves where they need to go to read the defense. Right. So, you know, what is the one common thing between all? Th- I mean, other than Baltimore this year, Baltimore had a pretty good offensive line, but. 
Kansas City wasn't that great protecting Patrick Mahomes no. this year. Um, no. Uh, even to a certain extent, uh, D- Deshaun Watson, it's notorious that his offensive line is always shit. And that's why they went out of their way for Tunsil and everything. And it was still kind of bogus. And it was still bad. So so at the end of the day, it takes more than, um, than, than just a quarterback. But sometimes, and I'm glad I saw a quote from Matt Nagy over the week that basically said he is willing to change his scheme. Because a lot I of people... Too, a yeah. lot of people are saying like dude you've got good players on this team why doesn't this work and sometimes you have to look at yourself and say am I too rigid right now am I not allowing my players to play at the highest level that they are and and now he's starting to realize I'm, I'm gonna have to bend a little bit when it comes to our scheme yeah I heard about that too so I mean I, free agency starts in I think like two and a half weeks yeah you know and it's gonna be interesting to see who goes where and who does what um there's some teams with money too, man. man the Bucks too. And you know, there's been a lot of discussion. So let's look at it like this. First, there's been discussion that Joe Burrow might pull an Eli. Or the I, I let said, me do you let me do you one did. better. Let he me do you one better. They said that that they think that he should pull he should, an, right. uh, yeah. Eli. One of the quarterbacks from the 1980s called him and said, Hey, you need to pull in Eli because I ruined my whole career because I got drafted to a shitty team. I don't want to say it was like A.J. Phillips or something like that. A, a, a quarterback from the 19, early 1980s gets drafted to a shit team. Right. He calls Joe Burrow and says, you should pull in Eli. Joe Burrow, he had the right response. I don't care who I play for. At the end of the day, the, the cream rises to the top. Yep. You know, you couldn't you couldn't say the same thing about – I mean, it's not like Baltimore was going places that were Super Bowl uh, you know, thing when they drafted Lamar. Uh, Kansas City, when they drafted – uh, uh, Mahomes, they had Alex Smith and were doing fine, but they yep. were in this medi- mediocre space. So sometimes it's not about who the best team is, you know? Right. Exactly. So Burrow's probably going to go number one. Right. Then, depending on any foreseen craziness, Chase Young Chase or- Young will go number two to uh, Washington. Mm-hmm. As far as I'm concerned, it might be a crapshoot after that because what does Detroit do at three? Yeah, we don't know do about they, Matt Stafford. Do, right, we don't know about Matt Stafford. Could could uh, Justin Herbert be that guy at three? Could Detroit somehow trade out of that pick at three and trade down? Does Miami get desperate? Yeah, they have and a lot they of picks. say because think about it, you could either go Justin Herbert or Detroit could actually go Tua. And just sit on and, and let him sit while Stafford does his thing. Yeah, and you get more picks out of it. Exactly. So there's that scenario. Yeah. Then the Giants are sitting there at four, and it's a lot of fans and people that are saying that they hope that the Giants they Take trade somebody, out of that yeah. pick. Yeah. Oh yeah. And try yeah. and get picks down. Then Miami's sitting there at five with their own pick, but they got two other first round picks in the first round. And then I was thinking about my own squad. I'm like, okay, well Tampa's sitting at fourteen. Mm-hmm. But, man, you know how much you would have to give up to jump two from 14 to convince some yeah. team maybe at five or, or six because six is, is L.A., the Chargers. Yeah. They don't have Rivers. Bridgewater is actually tight. His name is tight in with the Los Angeles Chargers. So, so if they so let's say if they go in with Bridgewater, would they take like a Tristan Wirfs who seems to be the top two offensive lineman with that kid from um that from Louisville, I, Louisville that threw yeah. like a ran a four six forty yesterday, That's which crazy. is <laughs> this man's three hundred and fifty seven all right, first off, let me, like let me rant on this. Let me rant on this. If that 357 pound lineman can put a 4640, don't make fun of me when I tell you that my 40 is the same. Every time I say it's the same, everyone's like, Nick, you can't There's run no that way. fast. It's no way. Blah, blah, blah. He just proved to me that I've been telling the truth this whole time. So piss off and leave me alone. <laughs> We're, now, we got 40s over here. Yeah, exactly. We both run a good 40s. Oh, and the Blackhawks are in overtime. Sorry, Nick. Uh, the Blackhawks no, are in no, overtime yeah, no, right now. Yeah, I need now. you guys. I need um, really you guys. Just... And, uh, and it's about three minutes left here, and they're facing Quinville and the uh, Panthers in uh, Florida. Uh, by the way, guys, while we're taking a little bit of a pause here, do us a huge favor. Um, I, I was listening to – oh, oh, my God. Um, Bobrovsky almost, just... almost gave it away. Um, <laughs> I was listening to Mac and Black – from last week, 
some of our uh, some of our stuff from the end of the show on um, the uh, the podcast app on on Apple. Do us a huge favor, guys. If you have an Apple product, it could be an iPad, it could be an iPhone. Go to iTunes, look up Mac and Black, subscribe to us, leave us a review. That goes a long way. All you really you, you can just say you know Mac is so handsome. Um, Nick, you know, he has the best personality. Uh, there, you know, I'm a female of the very beautiful variety and. I love them both, uh, you know, both equally. You could say all these types of things. Can um, I get Nick's Instagram? Yeah, give me his number. Are they single? Yeah. You know, any of these types of yes things. Yes and yes. <laughs> Do us a huge favor and uh, leave a review for us, guys. Uh, and uh, we would we would really go a long way for us um, and uh, and just continue to, to support us. That really helps us out. And, and again, if you know, I know that these things come on a little bit late in Saturdays. If you guys love what we do, if you're a fan of the if you're yeah if you're a fan of the podcast do us a favor share the show out uh if you guys you know have uh, have downtime at work and you can listen to something and you're sick of listening to the same 200 songs like i have since 1999 then just go ahead and find an audio podcast like mac and black uh go to use any app that you would uh, use we're on spotify we've already proven that um search mac and black podcast and we're there guys uh and i'm sorry i'm distracted here we've got about a minute of uh or no i'm sorry uh a, a less than two minutes left of overtime here uh, before we go to shootout in florida these are not very crucial points for us but that's a trip um crucial points for uh, for the playoff race uh in the east andrew wants to know do you think brady would have been this good in the system other than bella cheats I think Andrew's a, a Jets fan, so he's oh, going okay. to take a, a shot. A fan. Um, yeah. that's, that's hard to say. I mean, obviously, this good is a relative thing because we saw Manning be this good with multiple head coaches, multiple yep. systems. Yep. Um, if you're talking about winning championships, probably not. Uh, because, again, we all know by now that the Patriots are Belichick. And, um, you know, there's something about the genius of Belichick and what he does, you know, I was at the airport and I was reading a, an article that says that, you know, Bill Belichick was at a small time prospects uh, 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 camp in uh, in the rain uh, watching this this prospect. He was an edge rusher from some I think it was like Middle Tennessee State. Um, what didn't even have a profile on NFL.com. Didn't even have a picture on NFL.com. And Belichick is at his pro day. He's in the rain giving him instructions on on you know stuff. You know. This guy's a genius, and I would I would venture to say he's you know going to go down as the best head coach of all time. I, I would say I would venture to say in our lifetime, um, the Super Bowl trophy would be called the Belichick Trophy. Oh, they're gonna take Lombardi's name off yep. and put. Uh... I think you're gonna have to eventually, man. With the, with what this guy's done, and um, and I know there's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of people who want to say that the Patriots are cheaters, and I will say this, and 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 I'll say the same thing about the Astros too. Be very careful about, you know, throwing stones in glass houses. Mm -hmm. um, when you when when this whole Houston Astros things came out, everyone was on Facebook. Fuck the Astros. Nah, nah, nah. And then you saw how connected it was. You got people in the Mets organization that are connected. People in the Boston organization that are connected. And all of a sudden, you got players like uh, Dallas Keuchel on the on the White Sox. And all of a sudden, the Houston Astros are infiltrating your space, and you're thinking. Thinking, oh, it's not just the Astros. It could be us. It could be this. It could be that. And um, and that's why I say the Astros this year are going to be singing. If you if you don't think that uh, Jose Altuve and Carlos Correa, they're going to be like Aretha Franklin in those uh, uh, meetings with the MLB, uh, saying every single thing they can do to, to, to dirty up the names of other players, of other organizations, it's going to happen. I guarantee you we're going to see an investigation of the Yankees, of the Red Sox, of, of the Cubs, of some of these big-name teams over the last couple of seasons because, yes, cheating, cheating has been a part of the sport but what we're talking about is does every single team have this type of system of the Astros I don't think so Andrew says I am a Jets fan and believe me that was going to wait a minute I'm a Jets fan believe me that was going going wait a minute, was giving credit to God, like I can't read yeah. I am a Jets fan and believe me that 
I was giving credit to Belichick because he had the system that worked for 20 years that can't be taken away from him no matter what. Yeah. No matter how much I hate the man. Yeah, right, that's, right. That's, that's yeah. Point. But, but to your point, again, if you're talking about Brady performing, I think Brady's a quarterback. I, I, think, he, I think it's one of those things where he could have been like Marino. He could have been like Marino, a guy that's just in a place that just – We'll never get it right. He's always going to be a great quarterback, but he's never going to be that guy. He could have been that guy. Uh, but having Belichick around him makes a big difference. It makes, it makes a very big difference. My friend Alicia says, uh, hi, I love the Patriots. I bet you do. Oh, Alicia. She's from... Um, You're from Baston? No, she's from like upstate New York, like uh, Rochester. New York? All right, Rochester. All right, well... Alicia, I'm sorry about your uh, your favorite team and you know the choices you've made in your life, but that's okay. We still love you. Thank you for watching and supporting us. Um, I'm, we're watching the UFC. As long, as long as you don't start rooting for the Red Sox, it doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter to me. Yeah. That'll piss me off more than anything. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we'll take anything except the Red Sox at this point. As, as there's a lot of clamoring now that there's going to be a, a very tight investigation of the Red Sox under... Joey, is it Joey or Alex Core? It's Alex. Alex Core. Core. There's going to be a very tight investigation over the next year, uh, and we may see a Houston-like scandal coming out of Boston. Because let's be honest, Nick, what's the first thing that people said uh, if you're Astros talking about Boston? Boston wins the World Series, and the next year they're garbage. You know, you have to wonder. You have to wonder sometimes when a, when a team falls off like that. What is that? I know some of that was injuries. I know some of that they didn't have a bullpen. They were trying to you know cut payroll. Um, which the Mookie trade went down, and the Dodgers are all of a sudden now saying we're not affected by anything. We're going to continue to keep spending. Um, I'm I'm very excited about this baseball season, Nick. I, oh, I don't think I've ever both. been this me this psyched up for not only not it's crazy. I'm I'm. I'm as psyched as ever since basically 2006 is about the White Sox, but baseball in general, there's so many good storylines this year, and we're already seeing the revolt against the Astros. I think they've been hit by like something like nine pitches in three games. Or oh, something it's like ridiculous, that. dude! Um, and yeah, if you if you have a, if you <laughs> see a pro- yeah if you see a prop straight bet, feed. <laughs> if you see a prop bet in Vegas about being bean, they're going to be bean extra as uh, that Jonathan Taze, yeah. Uh, the captain just gets uh, a shootout goal as the um, Blackhawks take the f- – the s- yeah, so that's the bottom of the uh, leg there. So um, they're up one nothing in the shootout. It's a pretty crucial game. What is this? Is this for uh, the Rangers a pretty crucial game? It is. Man, dude, they, they kind of went to bed yesterday, but they lost uh, Chris Kreider to a broken foot. Oh, at, right after they signed him that, to that yeah, extension, he, too. Dude, he took a he took a puck off the foot, and they said Ouch. he fractured it. So I was, oh, I was like, Damn. Crawford, Crawford with a nice stop, and now uh, zero for two are the Panthers. As I, can they? No, they can't win it right now, but they can. Uh, oh no, yeah, they can win it right now, right? Who uh, the, Black the Blackhawks? Yeah, yeah if it's, they it's score it's over. Yeah, if they score it's over. <clears throat> they uh, score it's over, and it's it's Patty Kane who's forty six for one hundred and nine in his career in shootouts. He's five for seven this year. Nice. I don't know if you saw that. Five for seven. Okay. As Patrick there goes, goes there left, goes, goes. little deep. Oh game. my God, that was filthy. Nothing, uh, nothing. Bob can do about that one. Yep, Nets game. Blackhawks fans travel well. Yeah, they do. And there oh it is. man. And uh, speaking of spring training, uh, White. So, so I, I talked about this a little bit before, and I, we talked about it before the mics were on. I don't understand why we're not seeing spring training games on TV. I understand the idea of wanting people to to go, you know, to these spring training games, but people are going as Patrick Kane. That's just filthy. That's filth. That's just filthy. As he he uh, goes, uh, uh, basically under. Yeah, it was nine hole, right? I mean, right, right through the. He put he he pushed. uh, What's his name? (laughs) Bob. Yeah, all the way back (laughs) to the left and just just like a light tap after (laughs) playing with the puck. Right over to the left that side. What to do that's that filthy, nasty. dude. Um, so yeah, the, the the White Sox had a spring training game today. Uh, Lou Bob, Luis Robert uh, had a, a home run. Uh, Eloy Jimenez had a home run. Uh, we we haven't seen the pitchers. Usually, I think starting pitchers usually don't start 
you know, playing and getting starts until about the second week of spring training. So we've been seeing a lot of the AAA guys for the White Sox. And there's a lot of split squad games around this time, right. too. So we'll start to see some of the more, uh, you know, serious lineups here over the next couple of weeks. There's a lot of lineup talk right now. Obviously, this is the time to do it when it's baseball uh, about, you know, who's going to be uh, hitting where. Uh, you know, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm thinking about playing uh, fantasy baseball this year. I haven't played in quite a while. Right. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking long and hard about it because, you know, if you're a sports loser, you might as well just commit to it, right? right. I'm a sports loser, and I'm going to be committed to sports. I might as well just commit to it really fully and go. I'm not, I'm not XFL fantasy committed, but, I'm, you know, I, I could do some fantasy baseball. Steven Sellery cried her eight week recovery effort. Ouch. Ouch. But you know so what, th- what month is this? It's about to be March. It's April. March, right? Yeah. So that means we would have to at least be in the second round of the playoffs if we make it for him to come back. Yeah. God bless. I mean, at this point, I thought the Rangers did a good job with that. They could have traded him, but at this point, the value would have got back. Would that really make a huge difference? At the end of the day, if you can see Kreider on your team when, you're, when your team is good, you might as well keep him. He, he's a good enough player. I think, I, well, first off, the Rangers, for the most part, did exactly what I thought that they were going to do, mm-hmm. which was stand pat. Right. I didn't think that they really – they got so hot and the chemistry was there yeah. to a point where making a move was going to be stupid – and then as soon as they – okay, so here's what happened. First, they realized that they were going to tra- tra- trade Kreider. I think what happened is the Rangers had a real high asking price mm-hmm. on Kreider. Nobody was going was gonna to match it. And rightfully so. He's right. had a great season. Right. I'm thinking that the Rangers wanted multiple first-round picks or s- some kind of high package – for the draft coming out this year. Yeah. And no team was going to match it. Mm-hmm. So then they did the next best thing, which was lock them up. Mm-hmm. Then, out of nowhere, and I didn't even know this was happening, the Rangers, between John Davidson and Jeff Gordon, conned the Carolina Hurricanes to take Brady Shea for their first round draft pick wow. this year. So now the Rangers, for the second year in a row, potentially will have two first-round draft picks. Wow. They would have had it last year when they traded Kevin Hayes to the Winnipeg Jets for their first-round draft yeah. pick, but then they gave it back for Jacob Truba. So that's why when you have Glenn Sather, stupid ass that finally steps down, yeah. but you bring in a real hockey genius mind like John Davison, who's all about the New York Rangers and will do anything to make moves so we can mm-hmm. bring a cup back to New York, mm-hmm. you make deals like this. Because Brady Shea, I'm not going to front, he's not, he's not terrible. He's got size and speed. It was a contract, though, But right? I, I think that had something to do with it. And he had a bad habit of just playing just about the worst defense you can think of. Mm-hmm. So when you have Carolina that's in desperation mode because the Rangers are right on their ass yeah. for, for that last playoff spot, and they make these desperate moves, you're like, okay, I guess we can, you know, we can – Part ways with a Brady Shea and and uh, uh, you know I mean if you want to give us a first round draft pick sure yeah, and now sure. we hope you don't make the playoffs yeah because now we'll if the Rangers don't make the playoffs they'll still be in the lottery mm-hmm. then if Carolina happens to not make the playoffs now you now you're in the lottery twice mm-hmm. so that, I, I I just think it just works out really well for the Rangers and I think Gordon and uh, and uh, J D did a really good job. Yeah, and uh, and by the way, Ayan Kutaleba versus Magomed Islaimayev, I think is the name of his, uh, is the, how you pronounce his last name. I was looking forward to this one. This one's going to be a good one. This dude Kutaleba is a is a maniac. He's a psycho in in the uh, octagon. And yet, I'm sorry, Ankaleev uh, is this uh, this gentleman from Dagestan who is just a beast. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this one. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're watching UFC. Uh, obviously, as you guys can tell, we are live. Oh, I want to talk about this with you. The MLS is opening oh, yes. up this, uh, this week. They've, uh, they had their opening week. I believe it started yesterday or something along those lines. Um, by the way, uh, if you guys haven't been paying attention, the MLS has been steadily growing over the last 10 years. Well, this is, I think, am, I might be wrong. Is it 1999 when they started? I heard something that it was 1999. They tried it. That's got to sound about it, right. It, they said they tried it in the early 90s, and then it, it, it stopped. And then they came back in 1999. Um, and crazy to think about because now they are one of the more pro- 
profitable leagues in the in the uh, uh, American sports realm, which is pretty crazy. I mean, you, when you think about the NBA, the NFL, the uh, the the uh, uh, MLB, and then the NHL, uh, they uh, pretty much dominate the market. Then you got NASCAR, you got some of these other things, but but there's always that group after that that's kind of glommed together, and the MLS has has taken up a lot of that. They've got new teams now in Miami, uh, one, I believe, in Houston. Um, they, they, they're just really expanding, and um, they are talking a lot of shit. They're like, hey, they said, so basically, the Premier League in England is like religion. Right. It's like, you, if you are a fan of Liverpool, you are part of the religion of Liverpool. Right. By, by the way, Liverpool was undefeated this season so far. They lost earlier today to Watt for three to nothing. Uh, so they're ro- they are can't can't be un- uh, invincibles as they would call it in the uh, in the Premier League. They still will probably win the Premier League. Still favorites to win the Champions League, uh, and I think they're still in the Emirates Cup as well. So uh, they ha- still have a chance to win the treble, which is winning all three of the major trophies in in football. Uh, they just won't be undefeated as they lost today to Watford. But basically, these owners in the ML- uh, MLS are saying we're going to be as big as the Premier League in 2048. So, you know, they're giving themselves almost 30 years to get there. I thought that was a pretty nice one. But then they said they're going to be the third biggest sport in America soon. And I think, what did they say? They were going to take over the MLB because they take over over the MLB. And, um, And I can't lie, dude. First of all, a lot of parents are going away from football. I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with it, but a lot of parents are going away from football because of head injuries, stuff along those lines, and would feel more comfortable putting their kids in soccer now. And it's working. You know, you've got a lot of kids playing soccer. The I, this is pretty crazy to say, but the American uh, soccer team has a chance to be something special in the World Cup in a few years because uh, they've got some players, you know, Christian Pulisic, uh, Sergino Dest, a bunch of these players that are playing some pretty major uh, foot, football, uh, as you would call it in Europe, in Europe, and, and you know, can, can come and be big deals for, the, for America. And all it takes is one resurgence, a one, you know, final four appearance for the USA, and the next 10 years of football gets better and better so uh of soccer we should call it uh they call the nfl american football so we'll we'll stick with soccer i don't i don't like american football um so yeah soccer the mls uh is is looking good the uh the chicago fire uh changed their crest they changed their logo they changed yeah, they play the Sounders tomorrow, uh, and and the apparently you know the team is is looking better. Obviously, Zlatan Ibrahimovic left, but Chicharito came back. He's with uh, the Galaxy. Uh, apparently, Inter Miami, who is owned by David Beckham, one of the most the biggest recognizable names in all of soccer, um, is thinking about bringing in Luka Modric. Some of the biggest players in Europe, uh, they're in the twilight of their career, so you know, f- late thirties guys, not exactly like their older selves, but these are big names, and if if you could bring them to Miami, it's going to bring faces there. They're already trying to bring some of these big uh, European games to uh, to America. So, you know, we're going to see a resurgence of soccer. And sports is as profitable now as it's ever been. You've, you know, people all, you know, I feel bad for the players who, um, you know, played in the 50s and 60s and 70s. You know, they're like had to be insurance agents in the off season, And then they, you know, go back to playing professional sports. But you, they have to understand that this, this brand of sports, Sports is so damn profitable. When I buy this hat, when he buys his sweaters, when we, you know, we're supporting th- this team monetarily like they've never been supported before. So, yeah, yeah, and and the 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 um speaking of uh, the coronavirus because we were talking about the coronavirus earlier, you know, it's wop, been wop. <laughs> it's uh, it's been it's been very uh, it's it's had its sort of uh, reach on pro sports because you know uh, Siri A, who's the um the new or not the new they're the you know pro pro soccer uh, they've had to cancel five games um so you know it's it's having uh, the it's Olympics having an are effect. in trouble. Olympics and a lot of you know a lot of uh, players are not comfortable traveling, uh, so yeah, it's 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 having its effect right now. And, and sports, that's the thing that people don't understand when when the steroid stuff goes to Congress and people are like, well, Congress has nothing better to do. People don't realize how like 
entrenched sports is into culture. And, and you know, when you have stuff like that, and, and I did finish that baseball documentary, and one of the last chapters of it is about the steroid era and and you know how america the congress had to get involved and you know di- you know they had to bring guys like rafael palmero and roger clemens and all these people in to testify and it's crazy because I- i've never felt better about barry bonds than i did after watching that documentary because they put it into perspective for me how good bonds was and what they did put into perspective for me was that that sammy sosa mark mcguire race happened before Barry really blew up and all Which is true and Barry who was having an amazing season I think he was a first he was a he wanted to be the first guy to beat a 300 uh home run and 300 stolen bases he got it the year of the Sammy Sosa and um and Mark McGuire race and nobody noticed and he, he started to get a little bit pissed off about his lack of recognition. He thought he was the best player in baseball, and he might have been the best player in baseball at that point without steroids. Then they're talking that over the offseason, people are saying, dude, you've got Mark McGuire hitting 60-something home runs. You've got Sammy Sosa. They both got this attention. You know, Mark McGuire's in, in McDonald's commercials, and Sammy Sosa's a star in Chicago. Um, and Barry Bonds just thinking, dude, I can do this. And, um, you know, he, he may or may not have taken steroids. I, I probably think he did, but at this point, does it really matter it wasn't another thing that it really put into perspective for me was it wasn't illegal at that time there was it was all baseball players were on juice at the time i'm I'm trying to read this steven just sent me this uh this uh this picture about the rangers first round draft pick that they acquired from the hurricane okay so the Rangers traded Brady Shea to the Hurricanes for a 2020 first-round pick. Mm-hmm. And then in parentheses, it says Hurricanes option of Hurricanes or Maple Leaf pick. Oh, okay. So they could swap it to whichever the pick is the worst pick, I'm, I'm assuming. But then it says, but look, that's because freaking the Leafs traded their protected first-round, protected top 10 pick in 2020 mm. i hate this whole protection thing now. god it's, it's dude added, this is so confusing it's added so many more so are you telling me it. that the ra- if, if the hurricanes don't make the uh don't make the playoffs and they get a top 10 pick that, that the won't Leafs- go to the yeah that won't go to the uh it won't go to the uh to the to the rangers they could swap it with the other pick they could basically choose the worst pick to give basically the only way the rangers win in that scenario is if both those teams suck um but otherwise what who's the other team in that scenario? the Leafs. the, the Maple Leafs. Leafs. so you would be in a good position still if both teams didn't make the playoffs but at the same time, they could still choose the worst pick and give it to you. Ah! It's still a first round. And apparently, I don't, I don't know much about the draft, but apparently this year's draft is going to be pretty, um, I, I pretty, pretty deep. Stat. Yeah, I so even, even that's why I was upset about the whole Blackhawks trade because they traded Robin Lehner and they traded uh, Eric Gustafson. They traded Lehner for like a, a, a package of picks, a prospect, and P.K. Subban's brother, who apparently is a free agent, so they're not even going to bring back. Um, so a lot of people were saying, a lot of people who know more than I do were saying that they were upset about the re- return on Robin Lehner. So apparently Robin Lehner is not ruling out returning to Chicago because he's an unrestric- unrestricted free agent. He liked it in Chicago. He talked about if the Chicago can make some room in the offseason, he might come back. But knowing the Blackhawks, they probably lowballed him on, on an extension. And he said, nah, I'm good. And, and you know, left. <laughs> so. We'll see. Oh, 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 Bowman out oh, there, Bowman. low ball, uh, low ball. Listen, Bowman. I've got, uh, I've got ninety percent of my, um, my salary cap uh, tied into guys who are forty years old. Um, is there any way that you would take a bridge deal? Maybe you know, three million a year. Uh, well, actually, uh, Stan, we're getting offers for six or seven million. Yeah, I know, but have you been downtown Chicago? It's amazing here. You should stay. It's like, well, I know, but you have to pay us too. Like, but you know I, what else is cool? Have you been to downtown Las <laughs> Vegas? Before? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, have you been to downtown anywhere before? Yeah. Because yeah. it's nice everywhere, uh, yeah. and it's even nicer if you have three extra million dollars a year to you know uh, the, to work to make, with. Make, yeah, right. Make moves. <laughs> and, and I'm sure Robin Lehner is not going to be complaining about uh, the Vegas nightlife every single night. So, uh, good luck in in Las Vegas, Robin. Um, Andrew Berman brings up a great point. Oh you my know, God! Everyone. Look at look at this, dude! Look at this, Kutaleba. This is before the fight. He walked up and tried to fight him bef- in the in the. 
Dude, I'm telling you, this dude is a psycho. He is a maniac, this Kutaleba kid. I don't know what he's smoking, but he just walked right up to him and got in his face during the introductions. Uh, so... This and is, and and the referee's like, okay, let's 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 get this let's, going. Yeah, let's get this going because these two dude, this dude, dude, I'm telling you, he he looks like this dude. Any any dude who's sort of already like, ugh, he's overcompensating for something. He's a little bit scared because this dude apparently is a sambo wizard. This guy he's fighting, so that's why I'm really interested in this not fight. Gloves, no hell no, they almost fought before the fight even started. Yeah, this Ankalev guy is apparently a sambo champion, um, and Kutaleba has has heavy hands, but he's wild. So. Uh, people are talking about, you know, he he sometimes runs his head into people's fists. Oh, nice. Yeah. Little... Uh, Andrew says uh, when Sosa and McGuire did it, they weren't banned yet as far as the exactly. Steroids exactly. Yeah. And that's and but but that's why I want to say it was it also oh, wasn't. Oh! Oh! oh, oh, he's he's wobbly. Oh, my God. And he's still throwing. And he, oh, dude, he's wild. This dude doesn't even know where he's oh, at. He stopped, he stopped the, the fight. fight. He stopped the fight. He stopped the fight. He didn't you know even know where he was he at. He was saying he was baiting him. He was saying he was baiting him. Yeah, he was saying he was baiting. I'm telling you, this dude's a maniac. He was saying he was baiting him to come in. Some dudes do that. They kind of wobble to, to, to bait him. Oh, oh, he's pissed at the ref. And he, he's cooled down a little bit. Now he's, now he's like, all right, I guess I lost. Oh, what did he do? Are they going to? What is happening? What is happening? I've never seen that before. The ref, both fighters are clearly conscious. He was he was baiting him, I think. He was he was pretending to wobble um to bait him in and the ref stopped the fight. It, those were some shots though. Those those head kicks yeah. were some shots. Let's see let's see this again in the replay. What's that? Yeah, so we're watching uh we're watching UFC uh on uh ESPN plus and yeah if you see in the Kutale what he's doing is he's pretending so look look at him you see how he's always oh, pretending and he's throwing wild shots so look at the ref he's confused at this point he's seeing that he's seeing that Kutaleba is looking a little bit you see how he's kind of doing this with his body so look at the ref he's thinking oh my god this dude's wobbled and this ref is just not not should not be in there because at this point he's good look he's throwing full f oh yeah, this was a. Um, I, I don't think those either one of those leg kicks even connected to his head. I, I think he was just baiting that one him. did. He was baiting him the whole time, and even oh, he took one, but he's pretending. He's pretending. Yeah, I think what he's saying is I'm pretending. Oh, and he threw a little swim move to the ref too. Oh my god, I think he realized he caught himself an assault charge afterwards because he 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 calmed up real real quick after that. But he's not in his corner. I don't know what they're doing right now. Both fighters are are in their corner as, as if this fight is going to resume, but it looks like the ref called it off. I don't know what they were going to do now. I don't know if they're going to just make it official. Um, we don't have audio here, so it's, it's hard to tell. But, uh, oh, yeah, this fight is over. They're going to do the official decision uh, as this kid, Inkalov, from, uh, from uh, Dagestan, uh, beats Ion Kutaleba. Kutaleba, uh, he'll learn his lesson on that one. He was baiting him. He's telling him, yeah, I'm baiting you in. Yeah, yeah, he's... Uh, they'll fight again. They'll fight again. I was going to say, they're going to make it happen again. They're going to make it happen again. That was a good fight uh, up until that point, but this ref does not deserve to uh, to be there. Magomed Ankaleyev from, uh, from Dagestan, I'm sure one of Khabib Nurmagomedov's dudes... Um, Gets uh, gets the technical win. He has the longest active winning streak in the UFC lightweight division at four. The only other guy uh, happens to be Jan Jones. So, um, and and by the way, the John Jones Dominic Reyes rematch is now catching a little bit of traction. Uh, Dana Dana White is keeps talking about that. Uh, Jan Jones, yeah, you like that? Uh, yeah. So uh, and and Dana White now giving some traction to the uh, Dominic Reyes rematch. So uh, apparently that might happen and. You know, right now, uh, the UFC is in a weird place. You know, they, they've got to sell. That's the thing about the, people don't realize about the UFC. They got bought out for like something like $4 billion, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago. They weren't worth that much. They got overpaid. They right. overpaid for that deal, and they have to make money. That's why you see some of these cards that are – this card is a little underwhelming. Like, we, we didn't talk about it, but it's um, – it's, uh, uh, What's what's his name? Davison Figueiredo uh, and um, Joseph Benavidez mm -hmm. fighting for a vacant 
uh, uh, title that uh, Henry Cejudo gave up. This, this, this. Uh, the same Henry Cejudo when he won the title said, "Yeah, I want that." I'm uh, keeping it alive. I want that uh, Uriah Faber money. You know, yeah, what I want? yeah. He I named know. off three fighters that aren't even fighting. That aren't even anymore. fighting. And One and of them retired. Yeah. Um, as I'm watching a, a White Sox hype video, as uh, just pumped this into my veins, I just just put this in liquid form and just d directly IV it into my veins uh, as I'm watching Jose Abreu, Eloy Jimenez. Uh, all my dudes, Yo Yoan Moncada doing a little salsa. Yoan Moncada's a confident dude because he's doing a very effeminate salsa, and he, that's his thing now. He's just kind of doing the salsa dance all over. So, um, But, yeah, so the UFC right oh, now. Oh, Jesus, dude. What happened? Okay, so do you remember You remember that, that one guy that I always called out that I, that I guarantee you is a fake Yankees fan? Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember God, him. dude, he's mm -hmm. back. Oh, he's back? Okay. Oh, my God. Welcome back, sir. Not only is he back, but the wrestling promos are they they haven't stopped <laughs> so the beforehand he was calling himself the brash and the brazen oh, no. which is what Shayna baszler was calling herself in nxt when she was the nxt women's heavyweight champion now he's calling himself the yankee messiah which is a spinoff of what seth rollins has been calling himself the monday night <laughs> messiah he's not a yankee messiah this dude is barely a yankees fan i don't even think he's a yankees fans period Terrible. Look at this. Now nah, I this, gotta like, listen look to this, this crap. Look at this. This is before the fight even starts. Why he's calling his name? And, and you got security there, and security's not doing a thing. Of, look at them. They're they're all like. You had to have the, the referee come in and step in. This this Kutaleba dude is a psychopath. That's forty. And now him doing all that baiting and switching got him got him in trouble. Got him a, got him him a L. L. Yeah. I'm not saying whether I agree with it or not. I'm just no, saying. no, that was a terrible maybe, stoppage. Maybe, way. maybe next time you should. Yeah, just, and maybe you'll just, learn just your lesson fight. now. Just yeah, fight. The, just fight. The, yeah. All these dudes who try and do like there was that dude who fought. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but the Diego Sanchez. Did we talk about how Diego Sanchez has this weird corner dude who's like a, a mystic who's like all you have to do is center your energy into your chakra and and you will punch harder. And he's got one of these kind of crazy, um, you know, weird dudes in his corner now and. He had a fight against a guy who, like, was dancing into the ring. He does backflip strikes. He tries to, like, if you're laying on the, on the mat, he'll backflip and try and hit you with his legs. These dudes, you know, first of all, it's, it's cool. It's, like, funny to watch. It's like American Idol. What are, what is the first five episodes of American Idol? People love watching that because they just love watching people who suck at singing. Oh, easy. And it's like, oh, this the you know William Hung sucks yeah, so badly. Go. I'm gonna watch this, you know. And that's what we're seeing with the UFC turn to, which this whole CM Punk. You got Greg Hardy, and you got some of these guys who are just kind of gimmick acts at this point, and not not necessarily even you know fighters. Yeah, dude. It's getting a little embarrassing. They're they're doing the whole Eddie Gordo. Yeah, the, and, uh, you know, the kind of like the, what did you say, Samba, whatever that. that Samba, yeah, yeah. You ever seen the movie uh, The Protector with Tony Ja when he was oh, yeah, fighting yeah. the one dude in the, in the uh, uh, I don't know if it was like a church or synagogue, and he was doing all like that Eddie Gordo. Yeah yeah, 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 the temple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's doing all those Eddie Gordo moves, eh, that kind of stuff. Like, I'm not disrespecting, I'm just saying, I don't, I couldn't see that working. That's, that's, like, that's like when Steven Seagal said he taught Anderson Silva his front kick. Oh, oh my, God. first of all, Steven, you're from Detroit. Detroit. You're from Detroit. You're not a, a, a sensei. Well, he's he a Russian, he's a Russian. I know, but he's he, 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 they gave him that because he's famous, not because he, you know, like this is what people don't understand. He was <laughs> he was talking about how, first of all, uh, he said he's an Aikido instructor, and he taught uh, Anderson Silva a front kick. They don't kick in Aikido. That Aikido is a is a hand thing. They don't use their legs at all. So he literally he literally said he admitted he taught Anderson Silva. And by the way, one of the greatest MMA fighters of all time. And and this dude saying he taught him his his front kick. The I, one I, he used against Vito Belt. Yeah, Belfort. exactly. Yeah. The, the the front sort of teep kick. I, I have a very hard time believing that, Steven. Uh, but more power to you. Yeah, dude, Steven Seagal is you know, when I watch his movies and, and like he has to have that one segment where like, you know, he's got to show off his karate moves. Yeah. Dude, I. That, oh, God. Hey, Rachel. When, when I when I watch when I watch. Uh, uh, there you go, boss. Thank you. When I watch Steven Seagal movies. Yeah. Trust me, I'm not watching it for the no for the, the karate the moves. Portion. Yeah, no. Yeah, there's like the one. There was one where he was searching for this guy who was shooting everyone with this gun, and then 
Uh, Which one? Is, who? Who is it? Oh, uh, that it's that that's, one. That's it's um, that one. It's that one. And then and then like he just miraculously just walked into like walked into the hood and they're like, "What the hell is you doing here?" He's like, "I'm here for answers." And then starts showing off his karate moves. Yeah. Dude, you're a clown. <laughs> no, I do not believe these fake ass karate moves you're trying you're trying to throw out. He breaks the bull stick and he fights off like- <laughs> Yeah, 50 yeah, dudes, yeah. yeah. And, and the man makes no effort to spin or Not anything. Not to pretend yeah, that he's dude, athletic. what a he's piece just, of shit. Dude, he's, like, he's like letting the people come to him. They're like coming. He's like <laughs> snatching their face. It's like, <laughs> why do they keep running into his fist? Yeah. Yeah. Why is he just standing there? He just spins right into yeah, the fist. Right into him. Thank you. Guys, uh, I'm going to take this time out. To oh, nice. to um, write up my check, but also tell you guys a little bit about Mac and Black. Again, MacandBlack.com is the website. You would be doing us a huge favor uh, by going to iTunes, leaving a review. Steve, can you tell them a little bit about the process? Um, I know we're a little bit we're a little bit shorthanded with sure. our mics here, but tell tell them a little bit about how they can support us because uh, definitely a lot of people want to support us. Uh, they don't realize how easy it is. I don't think. Yeah, it's, it's really easy, actually. Uh, the link's in the description or the comments here to iTunes. But if you go to macandblack.com um, and you scroll down, you'll see the links to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, all those different places. So uh, choose your own adventure. Whatever, yeah. Whatever you like best, whatever is your preference, uh, check us out, subscribe there. And um, remember, you know, you don't, you, you know, put on the audio during the week you don't yeah. have to watch the video you don't have to keep it up you just put it on while you're working out or whatever yeah um and uh that's how to support us i know you guys like looking at our faces i trust me our faces are very watchable we've got we've got tv faces but radio voices is what i what i like to say but check us out on audio whoa 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 what happened be over here trying to diss my handsomeness, bro. No, no, I Are said. You we no, all I a said for radio. No, I said we have TV faces oh, with radio okay. voices. Yeah, I was gonna say. I said oh. people. People because that's think that's a great segue yeah. into this little segment. I need. I have to bring <laughs> Go up. Go right ahead. I please. have to bring this up. No, I, trust me. I know so, how handsome we are. So, so here's what happened. What do you got for us? All right. So, just to take a quick step away from the uh, sports side of things before mm-hmm. we jump back into the sport, you yeah. know, it's like. You know when you go to a pool mm-hmm. and they make you take the uh, twenty minute? Well, it's not even twenty minutes. It's like the fifteen minute recess yeah. where like the adults get to swim, adults swim. without having five million kids play <laughs> Marco Polo in the pool, and pissing and shitting, in and the yeah, pool. all yeah. the stupid nonsense that comes with it. So <laughs> Sunday, I went out with some friends to a place called Masada. Mm. It's a hookah bar out west, I think. Okay. So to make a long story short, you know, we're in there. We're all having fun. You know, I'm taking pictures. I just got my hair cut. Fresh baldness. Beards on check. Okay. You know, I got the fit. You know, I, I went door dashing, but I made sure I bring a, sh- a shirt with me that, uh, you know, uh, matches my pants so I can just go straight from door dashing to the spot. So I get to the spot, shake some hands, have a little conversation, talk a little bit, you know. Doing some G stuff. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, we're, well, not all of a sudden out of the blue. We're leaving. It's time to go. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they flip on the light and everything. And then what happened? I leave out of Masada. And, bro, this smoking hot Colombian. Mm. No. Thick, I'm telling you, this lady, this girl was thick as hell, too. For real? She's like, excuse me, sir, can you walk me to my car? I'm not gonna say no. So, so what? I watch. She walk. As a matter of fact, she was two cars from Giacomo, so mm. the walk wasn't that far. What a so I'm like a, a huge coincidence. I'm like, okay, this could be a sign from God, right? So I walk her to her car, starts talking to her. You know, she grabs my hand. I'm like, okay, this might go somewhere. Mm. And then this is where this is where I have to adapt to the uh, boomer society that we live in mm-hmm. because normally I'd have been like hey what's your number I hit you up well most of these girls don't know their phone number but you're a gentleman <laughs> so I asked her for a snapchat or Instagram or something okay. and she and I had to make this move because I knew that within three minutes I was going to get um, blocked from uh, from some of her friends 
I was like, you got a Snapchat or Instagram? I said, Instagram. So I pulled on my Instagram quick as hell. And then one of her friends, <laughs> one of her friends came over and she's like, oh, thank you so much, but we will take care of it from here, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, now nah, I gotta make this move. So long story short, I got her Instagram. Mm -hmm. Since that day, my flirting and confidence level <laughs> has been on is 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 B plus. On 10. Like all the way up there. Bruh, I was maybe at a D plus to B plus within a week. Damn. Wow. That's what so confidence a does. That's, that's and, and a little confidence goes a long way, yeah. bro. Yeah. Yeah. And, and especially the fact that I sealed the deal on the Instagram uh -huh. and I talked to her. Yes, I slid in the DM. You were yeah. all the way up in there? Oh, bro. I was all in the DMs, bro. So, all I'm going to say to the fellas out there, confidence goes a long way, man. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. For sure. And somehow, and somehow I'm, I'm going to have to try and take this lady out. Because, look, man, there's a lot of ladies out here who have never been taken out on the gentleman act. I'm mm. about their life. You know, in a lot of days where everyone thinks they're, they're pimps and players and everything, Oso Negro still runs through the gentleman act. You're running through you the got gentleman it. act. It, it also, it's also like one of those things where uh, if, some, if like a female is comfortable enough to come up to you and ask you that, then uh, then there's clearly, you know... You're giving off a good... It's uh, an unspoken... Exactly. It's yeah. an unspoken vibe that you're giving off that's like, you know, this dude's good enough to, you know... You feel me? Take me to my car. Yeah, I was just... I was and just innocently... Strong. I was just innocently going to my car. Yeah. Because it was the end of the night. And you look like you're strong enough to fend off any amount of people that would yeah. come and try and, you know suss out the situation right you, you would be there to block any you were sort regulating. Of, there was a, a, that that was probably the best way to end that sunday <laughs> that was probably <laughs> that the, confidence I, the, booster, oh yeah. oh my god dude easily easily it's so like I'm just, I'm just it's like spring training gives you you know gives you a little you know wind under your sails. Now I got to work on my summer body. Yeah, you, you and know, I I'm both. working on you this summer body. I'll be up at uh at North Avenue Beach talking to out of talking females mess, walking around there talking to all you got to do is just just go with a volleyball just go with a volleyball <laughs> true i could do that that's true, that's true. i could do that you, you could I'm always use really an extra person on the volleyball yeah, game yeah, you know? dude. like oh you, oh, you need somebody, somebody to make the team you need, you need somebody to make the team to make it make the whole <laughs> By the way, apparently this is the female I'll set you up. Ganu. I get you yeah. on the setup, but I ain't spiking shit. I ain't got ups like that. But I show up like, ding. You're a server. You're a server. You're going to let them be the star. I'm a spiker. I'm a spiker. I want to be up front. I want to be up front, and I want to be spiking. Hey, you know, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that because I remember so many years ago, I went out on, on, on a date with this girl. We went to uh, uh, GameWorks. Okay. We're playing OutRun 2, which is one of my favorite games of all time. As I'm creeping to the end of the finish line, in the back of my head, it's like, I should ease up on the brake to let this girl win. Uh -huh. <laughs> just, no, I can't do just that, to give man. her. And as soon as I was going to, I had already crossed the finish line. <laughs> you can't and even, then she's you can't like, pretend yeah, to be bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she goes, <laughs> then she's like, you know, you could have let me win. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I thought about it. But I was too late. I was at the finish line. Bro, I mean, that bitch drifted. <laughs> I was in there on some of that. Uh, it wasn't Vin Diesel, but whatever the white dude that Paul was Walker, in. You're on some no, Paul no, 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 no. <laughs> what's, the, what's the dude that starred in Tokyo Drift? Oh, that was not Paul. The dude, he, you're right. I, yeah. I like that dude better. He was no, it wasn't Vin. No, he was in. Uh, he was in the Friday Night Lights. He was in a couple of other things. I know yeah. you talk about. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't he know he was name. a little skinnier. He was staying with his dad in in Tokyo. Yeah, he was yeah. A dark uh, horse. No, was that, that, that first that first. Uh, How did that hot ass girl that didn't look. Japanese, but I guess I she was. And for some reason, Ludacris was in Korea or something like <laughs> that. Vaguely or Tokyo. Asian. Yeah. Vaguely Asian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this yeah. We're watching this, uh, we're, I, I believe, uh, yeah, it's Felicia Spencer versus uh, this chick. I think her name is Maya Farron. They're apparently saying this chick is like the female Francis Ngannou. She's just mauling chicks and, and knocking them out. She already looks much bigger than Spencer. Yeah. And uh, Spencer's a, a veteran, so I'm not expecting uh, anything. But she's a major underdog, and she already looks much more athletic as she took, takes her right as I say that. But, um, yeah, this this card, I believe this is the co-main event. So we're coming up on the main event here. Andrew wants to know, do, do we watch AEW at all this is for I, I I have not watched AEW in a while yeah dude it it is it, it okay let me put it to you like this and hopefully we can get Mike out here I was soon. gonna say I'm gonna try and catch Mike if we can because yeah, here's we'll what have him here soon yeah here's what I don't get 
Mm -hmm. People are like, oh my God, I can't believe that Goldberg would win the Universal Championship. He's 53. Chris Jericho's 49 and he's still the AEW champion. Yeah. Dude, stop being hypocrites, man. Yeah. I can't stand that. I'll go into it more than when, when Mike's <clears throat> here, but I've tried to watch some AEW, and I feel like they try too hard to sell moves. And once I see that, dude, I just don't like it. Yeah. I don't. So I haven't watched it in a while. I'm sure it's entertaining. I haven't watched it, but maybe I'll get back into it at some point. But They, they need some time to establish themselves, too. Like, you know. It's unfair to expect this thing that sort of came, it didn't come out of nowhere. I know this was a you know well planned thing by the Rhodes and and the people who uh, who who did the AEW thing, but it, it still needs sometimes to get to get its legs under it. You know, like people forget that the WWE is you know fifty years in the making, and you know probably even more. Yeah. Um, so you know you have to understand that the product isn't always going to be where it needs to be right away. It does need to get its legs and and. It's I I have a sense that the AEW is trying to find its own identity. They don't want to be WWE, um, but they have to figure out how they can do that without being gimmicky and without losing some of these you know uh, you know fans who are crossover. Because let's be honest, you're going to need fans who can cross over between WWE and AEW. Well, that's you, re that, you know what uh, it's really really weird to differentiate those things because it, it seems on the outside unless you're really into the, the people. Dude, this girl's getting um, raw. I know. It, it's really hard to differentiate those things. How, how do you separate those things? It seems like it's a lot of the same. Yeah, well, I mean, again, it's it's a different set of wrestlers, and you know, you got more storylines. But that's exactly what I'm saying. You you need time for these storylines because that's what wrestling is at the end of the day. It's storylines that have wrestling to do, you know, sort of mixed in there. Yeah, it's, a um, it's a show, sure. and and at the end of the day, yeah, they did find a lot of athletes who uh, were former WWE faces, uh, and and definitely had a lot of people that were enticing watches. But like you said, Chris Jericho is an older guy, and clearly not as physically fit as he once was uh, I'm sure the matches aren't as uh, you know physically uh, impressive as they used to as uh, we talked we talked this fair and chick up very heavily and Felicia Spencer just said hey Mac fuck what you were just saying I'm gonna pound this chick to the ground that's what she did uh, it, inside the first round it's Felicia Spencer uh, we'll move on and fan looks in deep deep pain it looks like it's an eye or, or sinus or something uh, maybe an orbitable bone or orbital bone um, as yeah Spencer gets a nice take Takedown, veteran takedown, and uh, just beats up on Farron. So I think the next one is going to be the Benavides versus uh, Figueiredo fight, which we didn't talk about it in depth, but Figueiredo missed weight by two and, two and, a, half, and a half pounds. Two and yeah. a half pounds, which in terms of UFC, that's insulting. You know, you got to know that you you have to be within. I think they say you should be no no more than three pounds away from your weight cut uh, uh, during the uh, during the uh, face offs, which happened two days before uh, the the weigh ins. Um, and clearly, uh, Figueiredo was not ready. Benavides is the only one who can win the the title at this point. Thank you so much. And and Figueiredo would be um, would still fight. Uh, for his purse, but even if he wins, he can't win the title, uh, which it's still an interim title, so they're still kind of figuring out how they're going to work this out. Henry Cejudo's being a little bit difficult right now. You know, he's he's over here talking about I piss excellence. He's trying all these sort of gimmicky, he's trying the Masvidal thing. He's trying to ride the wave and take it into popularity, and it's not really working for him, quite right. frankly. I mean, he's a little corny. He's already tried the triple cringe thing, and people know that he's just kind of a cringy dude um, and doesn't really understand quite, quite yet Yet, um, you know what? Why people are, are are infatuated with him? It's because he's a great fighter, and he's trying all these gimmicky things. You know this this whole Ron Burgundy type uh, type uh, atmosphere. It's not working. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. Um, what did Andrew say? Oh, he said my issue with Goldberg being the champ is they made the Fiend look so weak. They did the same thing with Brock Lesnar, bro. Yeah, that's all I'm saying, dude. They did the same thing with Brock, dude. I mean. That's how Goldberg is. You're not asking Goldberg to come back and then all of a sudden, you know, he's the one that's weak. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I think I think also too, 
I would look at the ratings to see how the Fiend was doing ratings wise as WWE champion because it couldn't have been that great for them to, to come out and just say, "Hey, yo, Goldberg, we want to put the title on you," and then here's Elimination Chamber, and then you, you'll just ride the wave all the way to WrestleMania when you're wrestling Roman Reigns. I mean, that's just how I look at it. I mean, I think Bray Wyatt is good and everything. He's just, yeah. I think the the Fiend to me is just kind of boring, and maybe that's what. You know, maybe he can have better matches with John Cena than he'd ever would with Goldberg. It so. wasn't a good transition from the Wyatt thing to the Fiend thing. It was just kind of like he went away for the injury, right? And then he came yeah. back, and then he was a Fiend. Yeah. And it was like, no, there was no real... The Wyatt thing, I mean, let's be honest, that was like years in the making of the Wyatt family and all the pushing they did of, you know, the Wyatt family and the storylines. I remember half, like half the episodes of Raw sometimes were connected to these Wyatt bits and stuff yep. like that. Yep. And and that's why Bray Wyatt and, and to a certain extent, what's the Braun, the, the bigger dude? Um, Braun Strowman. Braun yeah. Strowman. These dudes sort of were developed and you know them because of that sort of tight, you know, writing. And let's be honest, I mean... The, I, I still remember when I was a very faithful WWE watcher, I knew that the storylines were the ones that were really keeping me there. And even to a certain extent, I was watching with one of my you know, friends from, from you know, one of my neighbors, um, and we would, we would watch WWE and we would talk about the writing and talk about how, man, that was great promos, and man, you know, they're really you know, tightening up the, the creative side. And since then, you've seen... Again, they've been trying to branch out. Now they have comedians. You know, I know Tony Hinchcliffe was offered a job uh, in the on the creative team for uh, Vince McMahon, uh, but basically didn't like the fact that it was going to be very time consuming. You, you have to go to uh, Connecticut to to do it, um, and even living in New York would be a big hassle. So um, you know, they they've got very strict things, and the WWE is going to have to also adjust too to the whole AEW brand. You know, they got to find a way to adjust uh, themselves and not not. You know, not monopolize wrestling, but at the same time, still be that number one thing because I don't think AEW is threatening them in any way right now. Not right now. But it, but again, you, you have to get feet under you. That's what I want to say about the MLS too. You have to understand that. Oh yeah, it, let's go back to that. Yeah, one. yeah. The, you know, the MLS is is only twenty what twenty years old essentially. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to give it some time to really. We're, we're talking. I mean, if we're talking to Premier League, we talked about how it's a religion there. The reason why it's a religion is because it's been around since the late 1800s. Right. I mean, that is a long... We're talking centuries old. Um, it's hard to deny that type of footprint you get. And we talked about, dude... There's it's like we, we think of we think of pro sports as 30 teams, 30 cities, right? The Premier League, dude. First of all, there's five leagues. The Premier League, League One, League Two, League Three, League Four. There's hundreds, literally hundreds of teams that could qualify for the Premier League. They just have to make it up the ranks. We don't have that here yet. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have that with the MLS. You're not going to have that with the MLB. It's going to be tough, dude. Like the MLB has it to a certain extent with the minor leagues. But just imagine if every year two minor league teams got got promoted and then two major league teams got demoted that sounds a little crazy but they do it all the time there's even cases of Sunderland who was one of the best teams ever in the Premier League in the 1980s and 1990s in the early 2000s they got demoted three times they have a, a hundred a, like a hundred million uh, dollar stadium going to waste for a, a, a league three team that's a really start like if you if you had that and I talked about this in previous episodes that's a cool way to have a competition to basically say listen dude if you suck this year if you're in the bottom three you're going down to the to the minor leagues and we're gonna take two of those teams and bring them up here you know I play in a fantasy league like that it's tough every single year you don't want to get kicked out you're just fighting for survival so because you know even in week 16 when you're out of it you're trying to get wins because you don't want to be demoted so you know it's a, it's a nice way of competition but the MLS is going to take a long time to get to that point I agree with MLS when they said that they feel like they will surpass baseball yeah here's the funny thing like everyone's like oh my god soccer's so boring it's so boring it's like that. stupid dude if you actually went to a soccer game, it yeah. will change your mind. Mm -hmm. It is not that boring. The problem is, is, is we we always want this fast pace and we all want yeah. this this awesome scoring and this and that and blah blah blah. Yeah. But dude, there is so much passion at these games and there's so much passion at these teams. Like you would think, oh, the Portland Timbers. What the hell? Who are these guys? Yeah. That stadium is sold out Popping. every game, the and it jukes. 
from zero minutes to 90. Seattle Sounders fill up the Seattle Seahawks stadium every single every home game. Every single home They love home them game. over there. And, and let's be honest. Portland has the Trailblazers, and that's it, right? That's so it. I understand it. Seattle lost their basketball team, so I understand them. But you can you can build something like that in Chicago. You can build something like there's 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 a market for that. It's really weird though, because uh, you know, with the Premier League especially, since it's because we think of uh, the teams in the United States, it's so spread out. There's so much yeah. space in the United States. That's true. To yeah. England, you're talking city by city. It's like yeah. rolling meadows against Shaman. It is. That's true. You yeah. Know? And so it's, it's smaller than Texas. Right. I mean, right. it, you know, that's that that area is smaller than the state of Texas. Mm-hmm. You That's crazy to think about in a way. And you're 100% correct that this is literally like, first of all, they have the North London Derby because Arsenal's from London. Chelsea's from London. You also have Tottenham that's from London, the yeah. Hotspur. So you've got this sort of um, this feel of like you're going to have a, a Cubs versus White Sox type oh, rivalry yeah, yeah. in there. It's, but everything. Um, it's everything, like yeah. And, right down the street. And even if you're from Manchester, you've got you're either the Manchester United fan or a Manchester City right. fan. Yeah. You know, they have that type of dynamic. The MLS is going to take a while. I, I like the timeline they gave. They gave a 2048, which is what 28 years from now almost 30 years from now um realistic. it's realistic and and yeah. if you if you do the calculation the way that they've been growing the league in the last three or four years if they continue to grow it at this pace we're gonna start to see some more um competitive especially money wise because that's the big thing you know you make the most of your money from tv and until they get that that TV deal, which I think is coming, I think they they've got you know right now. There's so many outlets now. I mean, yeah, they, exactly. And but I think that's also kind of one of the difficulties that there's so many outlets that you know it's like, watered down. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like you know how it used to be with baseball, like you could turn on two five seven yeah, nine WGN. and see everything. Yeah, we talked about it this year. If you're a Cubs fan and you love the Cubs, and let's let's be honest, the one station that's synonymous with the Cubs is WGN, WGN yeah. and more, they're not going to have uh, any Cubs games anymore that's this insane. year. You have to have the marquee sports network, which so again crazy. is a money grab for the Ricketts and the yeah. ownership of the Cubs. And if you're a Cubs fan, you should be upset about that. I'll I'll be honest with you, dude. I mean, let's. I can't think of another fan base that has like 60, 70, 80, 90 year old fans like the Cubs do. Yeah, um, and m- probably most of them watch their stuff on like a old school antenna TV and they're expecting that Channel 9 is going to have the, the Cubs games just like it always does. And yeah. they're going to be in for surprise because uh, the Marquee Sports Network, which apparently is having a rough launch they're tough you know they're trying to find ways to stream games but the streaming services are not helping um they're just it, 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 people don't understand that it's tough to stream something for what could be three to five hours well, you have to be picked up by one of the big absolutely bi- yeah. one of the big ones otherwise yeah. you know or you're you're nothing nobody yeah you know uh, yeah it's 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 and it's make no business. mistake make bad no business. mistake marquee sports network has money but the problem is they're trying to save money and make more money for the Rickets, which, yeah. dude, the Rickets are billionaires. Like, what are the Rickets doing still trying to money grab uh, the, the, the city of Chicago? I mean, he, here's what the Rickets essentially said. We got you your, super, uh, your World Series. Now we're going to basically wring you dry for all of your yeah. money. And good luck because we don't even, first of all, we don't know how good this Cubs team is going to be. Does it ever really matter for them? Wrigley's going to be full. It never used to matter because no. it was always going to be on WGN. That's true. Catch yeah. it every game. Yep. Now and, it's different. And people showed up to the ballpark either way. Let's be honest. The team yeah. sucked for 40 years. Right. And people still showed up. And they made jokes about how there's always next year. But every single year, they were filling the stadium up. And let's be honest. I mean, people gave shit to the White Sox fans for not showing up for years. Look at the White Sox attendance this year. Yeah. I dare and damn to you. Yeah. By the way, I'm having a hard time finding a seat to opening weekend. Usually you can find something for 70 bucks. Now everything is 120, 90, 120, 500 level, $75. Good I would, luck with I would that. peep vivid seats, by the way. I, I, I'm, I've got a package, but the problem is oh. the package that I bought doesn't include opening weekend, which is kind of stupid. Like I paid almost, I paid almost $300 for this package. I think I deserve, you know, a, a nice, a nice opening weekend slot, but I've got a lot of, the problem with me is, you know, I work Monday through Friday, so I'm trying to catch Friday or Sunday. Sunday games right. uh, or early Saturday games, which is you know still going to be tough with with the podcast. So, um, but but 
either way, I, I'm telling you, watch the White Sox games this year. They're going to be full. Opening weekend, dude, is going to be popping at at this at what well, I keep wanting to call it the cell. Uh, <laughs> it's it's the rate now, guys. We just call it Comiskey. Um, and yeah, people and still do. I do too. And and same thing with Sears Tower. I'll still call it Sears Tower for the rest of my life. That's how stubborn I am. That's how American I am. Man, dude. The Ricketts. Yeah, just a money. These grab. guys are trips too, because this is the same these are the same owners that were fighting with those rooftop owners when they were putting that scoreboard know, up there. I know, because they were like, getting dude, a you cut. guys you guys <laughs> exactly. I'm like, are you guys really sitting here going to alienate what like kind of made Wrigley Field, Wrigley Field with it's the a part rooftop of club's owners. culture. Like, the on, rooftop dude. is a part of club's you're culture, you know? Off, you're cutting off fans' access to see the, the game and, and in their own way. And know? and remember, dude, they did that three-year construction project on Wrigley, mm -hmm. and it made it hell going to those games, apparently. I, I never went to, but I've, I've read that it was hell getting to those games, and the after, you know, Part of the reason why people go to Cubs fan, uh, games is because Wrigleyville. And yeah, yeah, you location. can go and, and, and have beers before and then go to the game and have beers after and whatever. And you Get can always up on, restaurant. You know. Exactly. Yeah, you can you can have this weird. So it's almost like it's kind of crazy. It's almost like, a, you know, New Orleans type atmosphere in Wrigleyville where, you know, everyone's shit canned. You know, you, it's illegal to have beer, but you can still probably drink and you can get away with having a beer going bar to bar. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of like Rush Street where th there's laws, but no raw. No laws you know uh, as long as you're in that little area yeah and then the and cops the cops are there but they're not really like patrolling they're just kind of waiting for something major to happen yeah. if nothing major happens they let it go and and uh you know we you know we as fans we have to be more uh demanding of what we expect out of our teams like if you're a cubs fan you know, you should have been clamoring about this whole Marquee Sports Network thing years ago because this was years in the making. And the Ricketts, let's be honest, they have some weird connections to some Republican, you know, uh, sort of uh, donors that uh, we talked about how the the network, which I think it's Sinclair Broadcasting, uh, is the same network that was doing. Uh, it went viral. A, vi a video went viral a couple of years ago of sportscast. Or yeah, 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 a bunch yeah, of yeah. telecasters basically yeah. reading the same script. That was Sinclair Broadcasting. Broadcasting, who just so happens to be the marquee uh, uh, company, and they're very unapologetic about that. By the way, they're, it's they're a syndication you know, network, you exactly. Know and they're again, they're unapologetic about that. And the Ricketts are unapologetic, and they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't apologize. It's their money; they can put it wherever the hell they want to. But if you're a fan, you're allowed to, you're allowed to say, "Hey, I'm not a fan of this, dude. I like it on WGN." And and by the way, they're not going to be on Comcast Sportsnet either. I thought they were going to at least share, like, okay, leave three or four games a month on WGN. I mean, the Sox do that all the time. No, Marquee Sports Network but has there, to have every any, game. Is there What's the package look like? Is there some sort of upside? I haven't Obviously, looked at it. I haven't looked at it. I, here's the thing. They're going to do this. some business behind it that makes sense. They're going to do the same thing, similar thing to what the Yankees did with the Yes Network. Yes, sir. They're going to make premium content for for Cubs fans. So yeah. they're going to go back to the 70s Cubs teams and let's bring you in and interview you and now we have an hour to fill with, you know, Ryan Sandberg and yeah. all these, you know, premier guys. And the Yankees when, are when, doing... When, when Sammy Sosa hit three home exactly. runs against XYZ. And oh, now yeah. we're going to put classic games on and yep. these, these types of things. There's always a way to monetize it, but the problem is the Yankees did that because, first of all, there's an appetite for that. Yep. In, the, in New York, there's so much being made about the Mets and Yankees, not so much, you know, championship wise, just support wise. There wasn't that type of tug of war between the Sox and the Cubs. Notoriously, this has been a Cubs town and, and, and will continue to be a Cubs town until the White Sox prove something. Uh, but even this year, you can feel the shift. Cubs fans are a little less cocky this year. They're a little bit less talk shitty this year. They don't want to. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty, and, and they're and not Cubs. ready. They're not ready to talk shit to Sox fans. Yeah. You know, Sox fans uh, for the first time ever have a little leverage to be like, dude, our team's you know stacked right now, and your team's not looking too good. So uh, it's and and speaking of the Sox. There's no excuses left for, for teams like the Sox and, you know, some of these other teams that have retooled. Even the Angels, dude. Like, what excuse do you have left if you're the Angels fan and you're upset about the trajectory of this team? They went out and spent more money this year, doubled down on the fact that they got their new uh, stadium or whatever they got. They have no excuses left. Same with the oh, Red Sox. Uh, Los Angeles, Los the Angels. Angels. Oh Angels. yeah, it's they um, what you call? It? I they got a TV thing. Too, some right? kind of yeah, some kind of naming, naming rights, rights deal yeah. or whatever yeah. it was to 
Angel Stadium because they said that you know the the owner of the Angels I can't think of his name mm-hmm. was a huge Yankees fan when he was little so he wanted Angel Stadium to be like Yankee like Stadium. Stadium yeah right that's and, a good, uh, but good model to go after right but, but you're, you're the Angels right but you're right though you're right in the sense where they spent a ton of cash like okay so Trout got his extension we know that obviously Rendon, Rendon you brought in and then they made a couple other moves but the still problem paying is for Pujo still paying for uh, Otani. But they don't have any other pitching. No, no. maybe outside of Otani, they're not ready. They're not. Re- I mean, the thing is, they're always trying to put a patchwork team around Trout. When really, what they should have done was, l- let's take let's take for example Milwaukee. Right, mm-hmm. Milwaukee had Ryan Braun for a long time. Right, and they had every single you know right in the world to go. Well, let's just build around Ryan Braun. But when they saw him take a half a step down. All they did was go, okay, well, we're going to have to make a Christian Yelich trade. We're going to have to start bringing in other guys. That's what you're going to have to do. You're going to need next level type talent around you. That's why, dude, the White Sox, they are ultra aggressive right now about re-signing Yohan Mankata, About re- They already re-signed Aaron Bummer to a historic deal. He, By the way, Aaron Bummer is not even going to be our uh, closer this year. He got closer type money from the White Sox. Uh, clearly, they believe in him and, and his uh, ability to be consistent because it was a four-year deal. And by the way, it was the first time ever <clears throat> that a non-closer got a pre-arbitration contract extension. Mm-hmm. The White Sox are pushing the boundaries in baseball about what it means to build a team. And they're, they're not just doing the conventional wait till he gets to free agency, gouge him in arbitration, you know, fight like hell to save every single penny. No. At this point, if, if you're a White Sox fan, you feel a little bit better about them pinching pennies for so long and, and you know, missing out on the Manny Machado because they, you know, were pinching pennies about $20 million, essentially, when they were going to give the guy $200 million already. Right. But, oh, you miss you miss out on Manny Machado. And, by the way, to the White Sox fans who said, oh, we can't, we, we wouldn't have been able to have Machado on this team. That's not true. You could have had Machado, and you could have still made all the moves you made this offseason. I'm with so you I on that. So I don't want any excuses from, I'm done. I'm done with the excuses. Same with Rick Renteria. Rick, I love you, buddy. You've got, you know, you've got something in you. These players like playing for you. And I... I value that very much, but it's put up or shut up time. There's no excuses left for you, Rick. You've got the team now. You've got a stacked lineup. You've got a good bullpen, solid rotation, lots of young players, and there's a lot to be excited about. And I don't want to see anything this season that will say, well, we're still feeling some things out or uh, it's a little bit too soon for us. Nope. No more of that, dude. Ready for the playoffs. We're ready for a pennant push. You have to be ready for it. The way that you've been spending money this offseason, the way you've been allocating money to re-signing and extending your, your core players, you clearly believe that these next three or four years is an open window for your team. It's put up or shut up time. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And I, I think what the White Sox is, I think they notice it's almost like a, a shark noticing blood in the water sure, sure. to an extent where they they knew that 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 the cubs were going to be on this downfall mm-hmm. where okay so you had the glory years of tw- you know the 2015 to the 2017 stretch yeah. where you go from NLCS to World Series title mm-hmm, back to mm-hmm. NLCS and I mean they've kind of fallen off of the uh, boat since then and I think at, if you're the the the, uh, the White Sox, you, you're saying to yourself, okay, we got to get back. You know, we'll make these under the radar moves, or you know, we'll make these trades to build up, excuse me, build up our farm system. Yeah. And then you know, you make a lot of little minor impact moves, mm. but it's almost better than anything that the Cubs have been doing because they're quote unquote strapped for money. Where the Ricketts didn't really let them open up the checkbook to get who they wanted because they got the the Cubs had a situation where I felt they had too many players, just not enough positions. Mm. Where it's like, okay, we could use another outfielder, but we don't have you know this isn't softball. We use four outfielders, or like Schwarber is not an outfielder, but He's we're not. gonna make him an outfielder, and exactly. we don't have a DH, you know. Exactly. And, and honestly, Nick, the the White Sox, I'll I'll be honest with you, I don't think the Cubs had anything to do with this. I thought. And I may be wrong about this, but the Nationals winning the World Series changed the perspective of a lot of teams. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of teams saw what the Nationals were last year. Let's remember, 
a terrible team for the first three months of the yes. season. They didn't have what they needed early in the season, and it looked you looked up and down the roster, and you went, ah, man, yeah, they lost uh, Harper. They had every excuse in the book to, to just kind of phone the season in. And next thing you know, you start to see the Trey Turners break out. You start to see some of these guys uh, and then some of their young talent, which, again, I like to liken the White Sox moves to the Nationals moves because you look at Robles and you look at some of the guys they have in the outfield right. and then you liken them to the White Sox who have Jimenez and Robert and some of these guys. The White Sox clearly saw that the Nationals had an even smaller window. I mean, the Nationals window was like cracked. Our window is wide open. There's no more capacity. It's like, you know, you've hit the you've hit the 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 edge. Your window can't be any more wide open. And when you see a team make a run like the Nationals did and beat the teams that they did and let's be honest, beat a team who was cheating. I mean, you know, at 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 some point you have to look at um, you know, you have to look at the way that the Nationals won it last year and see some hope. And that's why again, I think that's why the Cubs were a little bit nervous to trade Bryant and Contreras and all the guys that they were going to trade this offseason because they thought to themselves and they said, well, let's be honest, the value of these guys isn't as high as it could be in the season. If Bryant has a good first month and a half of the season, if Contreras has a good month and a half of the season, that's better trade bait back right. then. So I think what they said was it's it's a win-win for us. We can still you know increase the value of our players or at the very worst, it'll be even the same. Or we can overachieve for a month and a half, two months to start the season. And who knows? They might be buyers. The white, uh, the Cubs might be buyers in in you know uh, you know leading up to the deadline if if everything goes well for them. Now a lot of things have to go well for them. Let's be honest. That rotation, you know, it has some names in it, but you have to look at it and say, well, Lester's getting a little bit older. Quintana is not what he once was. Darvish is not what he once was. Obviously, Kyle Hendricks is a great pitcher, but can Hendricks real? I mean, we saw what it was like for him last year. Sometimes with that defense behind him as good as Baez is you really don't have that strong of a defense behind you uh, especially other than, with him going to shortstop absolutely this year. and then and then also Lester can't field his position I mean you, you've had notoriously older guys who can't field their position Darvish fits into that uh, Hamels last year fit into that so you know the Cubs clearly saw themselves in a transitionary phase uh, you know, obviously they could have traded Bryant this offseason. They could have traded Contreras, Contreras this offseason. And I'm I'm sure Cubs fans are happy that they didn't because now that they at least have that that glimmer of hope and, and maybe they can make a run. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with the Nationals. Did you hear the story of supposedly Mets fans sending money to Brody Van uh, Wagenen <laughs> through Vemo to help Mets player or uh, the Mets front office pay for pay for, for certain players? I mean, Bro, it, I swear to God, the New York Mets have to be one of the biggest <laughs> jokes in, in Major League Baseball. And, and they have money, too. That's the worst part That's about it. That's the worst part about it. But, dude, the Will Ponds are so cheap, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, think about it like this. You, the Mets right now are banking a lot on Yoannis Cespedes to come out and have, like, this monster year because he's Robinson coming Cano off of – Yeah, like, these guys are coming off of contract years, and they're pretty much playing – for the next contract, mm -hmm. so you know the, you know all of a sudden here comes Cespedes, knowing all he's on the last year of his twenty whatever. They restructured, but they're still paying his ass. Dude, this you know? man's getting like twenty some million dollars a year, and, and he barely uh, played, and he barely played because he fell off his horse. There was a lot of talk about the White Sox, Razorbacks, or whatever. Too. Yeah, I know. And, and you know what's crazy, you know. Uh, I know the Boston fans know about this, but like Rusny Castillo, he's making twenty million dollars in in minor leagues. Um, there's another example of that of some of these guys who uh, oh, there's a, there's that guy in Arizona. Uh, they signed him. He was great for a year and a half, and he got an extension of a twenty million dollar a year, and he's been playing in the in the uh, uh, in the in the minor leagues. Uh, let's not forget that you, teams make mistakes too, and the Mets are not any different. They have made their share of mis mistakes. The problem is they're not willing to I guess you know throw in the towel on their mistakes they'd rather see how this team does and again I think that has to do with the Nationals too because let's remember the Mets they sucked for it, we're in a very similar position sucked for a lot of the season then remember that last like two and a half months of the season you were looking at the Mets and they were in it they could yeah. have made the, the, the playoffs last year uh, they just kind of fell apart towards the end and a lot of that had to do with managerial stuff and, um, and again I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that Edwin Diaz forgot how to close 
That's true. Their bullpen was really bad towards the end of the season. Man, dude. Familia was, was, I mean, you know, you you have to look at the guys like Familia and Diaz. They they almost forgot how to pitch. Yeah, and, like, the thing that kills me about, about, uh, you know, the Mets was – I know Mickey Calloway caught a lot of hell for a lot of the the, yeah. the uh, managerial decisions that he, you know, may have done with this team. But yeah. what what kind of blows me is it's like, okay, if my team's up five two and I'm bringing in a guy who had like fifty seven saves with was Seattle one of the Manor best closers year. in the league right. last year. Uh-huh. I would expect the man to go out there and get three simple outs so we can go ahead and close this game. Yeah, out. that's what you're expecting. Yeah, yeah. and then, and then sometimes you would see certain men's fans like, oh, I can't believe Miku Callaway keeps bringing this guy in. Well, it's his closer. Yeah. You know you're what I'm expecting saying, him to you're be able to get three him outs. To go out there and get three simple outs, so we can go ahead and go home. Especially with the lead, you know, that's what his job is. Man, dude. So I don't understand what the dip. Well, I do understand. Like some people just aren't cut out for New York. Yeah, you know. And that's I true. think, I think. Oh no, US- it's over. Davison Figueiredo. Oh, oh my God, God what a it. nice job! As the Benavides uh, Figueiredo fight has started, and Figueiredo got uh, Benavides down and almost arm arm triangled him and got a nice hit in there. Yeah. So. I don't know, dude. I, I think I think Mickey Callaway took a lot of took a lot of heat, and I don't know if uh, if Luis Luis Rojas is planning on doing anything different. But one of the biggest talks that's been going on right now is that the injury bug is still hitting the Yankees. We're not even in oh, the yeah, first. Oh yeah, I know that's right. Severino goes down. He has to have Tommy John surgery. Uh, so that's a season, I, right? That that's he's gone for the year. Wow. Uh, you, we know that James Paxton had that back situation mm-hmm. he's gone for three months they're saying at the earliest that he might be able to come back is at some point in may um if they were smart they would wait till june to bring mm-hmm. him back and then herman has the suspension herman has suspension he got into a car accident oh my while god while he's down in in the dominican oh republic um john carlos stanton may not make the uh all-star game because he's for whatever reason strained his calf again i don't know what's wrong with his dad that's what got him right. in trouble Crazy. getting hurt in the playoffs last year he had a calf strain and just could never recover from it when they really needed him i and didn't now realize Aaron, he only played 19 games last year or something like that that's crazy he missed so much time he had some type of he had tendon. the calf right he had he, there was the calf and then there was this bicep tear or flex tendon that's or right. whatever yeah, it was yeah, that's right. uh-huh. that made him lo- miss so many games as well. So, you know, I don't know what's wrong with Giancarlo. I don't know if it's whatever the strength and conditioning is for the New York Yankees. At Yankees, some point you have to look at that, right? Because last season was just like this, right? Where it's yeah. like, and, and I don't know if they brought back the same staff, but at some point you have to start to look at the staff because it's like, dude, these these players are dropping. Like, like Remember the last month, the first month of last season, dude? That was nuts. I'd never seen anything like that in baseball where you have like 10 or 12 guys in five weeks go on DL stints. I mean, that's crazy. It's crazy, but at the same time, the Yankees farm system is so deep yeah, right now. and Boone did a great job at the beginning of the season He last really season. did. So so this what this where this comes in now. You're going to have no Hicks because Hicks is coming off of Tommy John. When the Yankees lost, he went under the knife immediately. Mm-hmm. You're not going to have Aaron Judge because it looks like Aaron Judge right shoulders giving wow. him his situations, and he hasn't even taken batting practice oh my goodness. in almost two or three weeks with the shoulder injury, so he's probably going to be out. So you're not going to have him. You won't have Giancarlo. You're not going to have Big James or the Big Maple James Paxson, and you're not going to have Luis Severino. So that now puts more pressure on Jordan Montgomery to come back and, and, and try to catch lightning in the bottle with him. That now means almost um, – Oh, what's the kid's name? They're talking about like Loisiga. You still have and, Frazier and from the from and Clint Frazier is another Frazier, name yeah. that needs that needs to uh, be brought up. This is the time to shine. Like, see the thing with the thing with Clint Frazier though, is that Clint he wanted to be full time last year. His, right? his biggest the Clint Frazier's biggest enemy is Clint Frazier. Yeah, because the kid knows what he needs to do. He knows he's a talent. He knows this and that, and he also knows. That his mouth made the distraction <laughs> yeah. that he's saying that he can't be for this team. Right. So. Which is stupid. He's gonna, you're which you're is, a young kid. Like, and, come on. Dude. Right. Right. So, in my opinion, I feel like this is the time to shine to where if Clint Frazier does come out and snap off, the Yankees are now putting in the predicament like, okay, so what do we do now? Do we do, you know, we're going to keep Frazier. He's young and we still have yeah. plenty of control, control with him. Yeah. But. 
do we get rid of Giancarlo now? Yeah. You know, does what's his name retire? Because think about it. The Yankees went out and signed that 16-year-old Jason Dominguez. Yeah, that's right. Who's flipping, tearing it up right now in the Yankee single-A farm system. The only problem is he's not going to be coming up for another three, four years. Yeah, yeah. Which is why you signed Aaron Hicks to the deal that you did mm -hmm. because you know that he is the heir apparent of center field. Yeah, and um, a great center, great defensive center field. One, one of the best arms in the league. Exactly. So... You, so I, I I don't know, man. It, it just kind of sucks right now, but it's going to be the next man up because you got Mike Talkman. He went down. Mm -hmm. He was playing really well before he went down. Um, you know, Brett Gardner's coming back, but he's yeah. forty now, yeah. and it's just it just seems like a lot right now for but the Yankees. But I'm glad it's happening now, exactly, and you know that exactly. that a few of these guys are gonna be able to come back. But like yeah. they said about. Um, like they said about uh, what's his name, um, John Carlo. Stu's built like a Greek god, but can't yeah, he stay is. healthy. Yeah. And it's just, it's just mind boggling. You know, this is still though. What I was gonna say was, this is the best time for that to happen because yeah. no games have been played yet. There's still hope in the air. No matter what happens, you're starting off zero and zero, and all you have to do is just that's that's the whole thing about. You know, winning baseball games is as much a routine and repetition thing right. than it is playing good baseball. Right. Because everybody starts off the season 0-0, and, and everyone has that same sort of level of, of chance. And um, sometimes all it is is learning how to win. And that's why I was happy that the White Sox brought back Rick Renteria because they didn't judge him by his record over the last couple of years, but the progression that they saw in the players and in the team and the competitiveness and, the, and the, just the excitement around the team has grown. And sometimes you have to judge it off of that. And that's why the Yankees, you know, they're not going to be over. They're not going to be like, oh, my God, the season's over now. No, they're ready to come into the season. They've got a pretty nice, you know, we you saw it. Last year, Garrett Cole continues to snap. Absolutely, and you're going to have a top-heavy uh, uh, rotation. Yep. Um, you know, Tanaka is still Tanaka. As yep. much as you want to, you know, I know he's going to be a free agent after this year, right? So, yep. you know, this is a big season for him. Uh, at at some point, you're going to get Herman back. You're going to get, you know, uh, the Big Maple back. There, there's a very, you know, there's a very uh, uh, eerie sort of thing when the Yankees are being fiscally responsible and not just throwing money at people because the big thing is you know they can if they want to. Right. Like, if the Yankees wanted to, they could fuck up the game and they yeah. could just go sign anyone they want to. Yep. And that's why people don't understand that, you know, next year and every single year after that, they're going to be players in free agency. And every single year, you're going to have the opportunity. And most teams... If they took on that that uh, that Stanton uh, uh, contract and then uh, and then had what happened to them happen, uh, they would have crippled the franchise. Not the Yankees. They'll be fine with or without Stanton. They'll they'll figure a way out. As we just watched Davison Figueiredo uh, just absolutely take it to is Benavides. That, is that his hairstyle? It is that, his hairstyle. Oh, that, yeah, that, it's that, not that, blood. No, and what's his name? he's it's he's mad. Bleeding. He's mad that the crowd isn't cheering for him. But they're not cheering for him because he missed weight. So he needs to understand why they're not cheering for him. As uh, I believe i want to say that they're in his hometown benavides is his hometown so uh now they are giving him a little bit of respect he's asking for respect from the crowd i saw that uh i saw that uh that uh benavides had his uh his, his head cut i couldn't tell if it was a headbutt or not uh but it was it was it looks yep headbutt um and um that was unintentional i think on both cases uh oh my god the blood started flowing within a second of the headbutt uh as yep headbutt happens uh blood starts gushing right away and next thing you know figaheda another headbutt that's two headbutts and uh right in the same area takes one to the uh t takes one oh man benavides that's within seconds oh my God, that was a right hand that puts him out. Uh, yeah, Benavidez, a cut or not, that was a nasty right hand flush on the mouth. Uh, and Benavidez went down a couple extra for good measure as Dan Mergliata uh, stops the fight. Davison Figueiredo, it's too bad he can't win the championship, but he just took the uh, took the money from, uh, well, actually, technically speaking, the 30% then he lost from his purse is going to Benavidez. So Benavidez getting a nice payday either way, but sucks for him because he could he could have won the belt with this fight. Uh, Figueiredo, a lot of people were thinking it was the better fighter. He should have just made weight. Just make weight, bro. Like, come on, Like, this man. is your job. It's, your it's job. not, it's not job. like you just woke up and I'm like, what, what do you mean I have to what? be at... What? I have uh, to cut weight? I didn't know. What do you like, mean I have to be at 145? Come on, man. 
And at the same time, listen, uh, there's a big push right now for from Joe Rogan and some of these trendy MMA guys to end weight cutting and to allow us to have more weight classes. You know, there's a big jump from 145 to 170. You know, there's there's space for more weight classes, more belts, more people, and it makes it safer for these fighters because let's be honest, a lot of these fighters are cutting 15 to 20 pounds. Um, that's that's a tough weight. That's not a natural thing for your body to do. Uh, but still, if you're Figueiredo, man, you you just screwed up a, a title shot for yourself. 145 to 170. Isn't there something in between those two? Uh, no. I want to say... 155? One, one, no, 155. Did I say 145? Yeah. It's 155 to 170. Oh, okay. All right. yeah. I was going to say. Yeah, but that's, that's, 15, that's 15 pounds between 155 and 170. I mean, you there's something you can do. 170 to 185, 185. 185 to 205. I mean, there's then, space yeah, there where you can make it so that you have more champions. I mean, let's be honest. That's more money for them. They can have more uh, title fights, better cards, more more guys on the roster. You know, they're, they're, it's a win win for them. So, uh, I, I th in this case, and I'm assuming Figueiredo right now is talking to the crowd and um, and telling them why he missed weight. But uh, he's he's you know probably talking about you know how hard it is to cut weight, which I understand. But don't take the fight, then, bro. Like, right. if you know you can't make the weight, you're fighting for the flyweight title. If you can't do that, then don't. And by the way, the flyweight you know division is probably going away. A lot of people are saying this either way this this isn't going to save the 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 weight class because cejudo has gone he doesn't want to fight in uh, in flyweight anymore demetrius Johnson demetrius johnson is in uh, one fc now there's really no reason for it but yeah that, that's a nasty headbutt uh, that gushed his uh his forehead right away and then there's another one right yeah another one that looked a little bit less severe and then boom to the body and then you'll see he wipes it away and this is just flush right Man. in the mouth that is nasty uh Benavides is going to be feeling that for a couple of days uh luckily for him he goes home to megan olivia every single do you know who megan olivia is i do yeah he goes to meg he goes home to megan olivia every night so i, I don't feel so bad for him um there was oh i'm glad you brought up mma mm -hmm. i know you're glad, glad you brought up mma can you please tell the people your thoughts on joe rogan <laughs> yeah, no, we were just talking about how um, the, the that's what we wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. The Felder fight, Felder versus um, Dan Hooker last week yep. was towards the end of our show last week, and we saw it happen, and actually we had just gone off air, and the fight was ending, and I looked at you and I said, oh my God, what an amazing fight. We missed that fight. I'm going to rewatch it, and uh, it was an amazing fight. Felder lost by decision, and I saw him right away start clutching for his gloves, meaning you know he's going to take off his gloves. In the in the in the uh, in the octagon, which usually means you're done. He did say something along the lines of, "I might be done. I got a daughter at home. I hate going away for." Her. Uh, but he's also an amazing MMA commentator and one of the best up and coming guys. Still very mentally there. That's the problem with a lot of fighters. You don't see a lot of good uh, former fighters who fought a lot become good commentators because True. dude, they they've taken a lot of punishment to yep. the head. It's very tough. I mean, even like Randy Couture to a certain extent, um, he does an okay job with uh, one or with PFL but there's sometimes where you're like are you all right Randy because you sound like you just got in the head right now but um but either way Joe Rogan has been criticized very heavily uh, over his last five or six uh, uh, commentating uh, gigs. He had that one gig with the Dominic Reyes versus John Jones very slanted towards Jones a lot of people were saying you know I I said this to you before the show Nick it's hard. We are humans. At the end of the day, we're all human. We're all sort of had the same genome and the same sort of, you know, way we kind of go about things. And it's human nature that if somebody's a friend of yours, right. you have a natural bias towards them. True. If you and I, you know, had a, a, a very, very strong relationship like we do, and then you went and I was having to commentate your one-on-one -on -one fight with Randy Couture... I'm going to be a little bit slanted towards Which is going to happen right happen. away. And I'm still going to do the commentating on that. And and I'm going to be a little bit slanted, dude. I'm going to look at the guy that I like and that I value and who's my friend, and I'm going to say a little bit nicer things about him. And that's what people were complaining about with Joe Rogan was he was very biased towards John Jones in that fight. We've seen this happen with uh, the cowboy fight and the uh, uh, cowboy fights in the past. He's very close with Cowboy Cerrone. There were some fights. I think one of them was a Masvidal fight where Masvidal just beating up on Cerrone and the whole time all Joe Rogan can talk about is how great Cerrone is so 
There's a lot of criticism <laughs> about him. Uh, he's. I've been thinking Joe Rogan has been pure ass for the longest time. As a matter of fact, I have been crying like when uh, what you call it went out, mm-hmm. Strike Force. Yeah. I was like, why don't you take? I thought Moro should have, you know, right away been in the UFC. But that, but at but the he's time they had, yeah. but at the time they had uh, Mike Mike Goldberg. And no, Mike, that's right, Goldberg. And, yeah. and Goldberg was decent. And he moved on to Bellator, and he's doing okay with Bellator. Yeah, and Bellator yeah, yeah. likes him. Yeah. So, so you bring in Frank Shamrock, mm-hmm. and why I can't think of who was with him? Like this guy owns a camp. He's very uh, uh it, you talking like, about Brian you're not talking about Brian Stan, are you? No. I think it's Tim I almost want to say Tim Bosch, but that's not uh-huh. I don't think that's not right. I can't think of the Is guy it? that used to be with with it was Frank Shamrock, Morrow, and there was another guy that was with him. It wasn't the, Boss Rutten, was it? No. Whoever it is. The guy has like his own camp. Okay, which was what you need at the end of the day. You need yeah. guys who are still active. Yeah, um, and this guy had his own camp. He had fighters in his own camp. It's mm-hmm. like it's a very, it's a very familiar name. Like if you said the last name, or it, the wasn't, first it wasn't name. Rampage. It wasn't um, no. Yeah, Hold you know what? I'll look it up. You yeah. go ahead. No, yeah, you go look ahead. it. I'll look it up. So I was saying, why don't you take Mike Goldberg, bring in Frank Shamrock, and then bring in. Tim, whatever this guy's name is, mm-hmm. right? That would be better than Joe Rogan's pompous ass, who, uh, uh this is a great go go plata. I'm like, dude, you're <laughs> such an idiot. He, and, he and knows people, MMA, he knows uh, jujitsu, but for some reason, he's been very off on his commentating. Okay, I give not you, just us. It's not I give just you, us. I give you a prime example. We should have hung up his his uh, commentating. When Bay beat the complete Pat Militich, Pat Militich, Pat Militich, Pat Militich. yeah, thank you, yeah, Pat Militich. It was it should have been Goldberg, Frank Shamrock, Pat Militich. End of discussion because there's no way. I, it's, and I love Morrow, but yeah, I don't think great. the UFC was going to go against uh, Goldberg, which for they Morrow. did years later. They they soured on Goldberg years later, but they soured on him for John Anik, who is a lifetime Fox guy and was doing a lot of the you know small-time Fox stuff for them, and he's turned out to be a good commentator. He's good at play-by-play, but the problem is Joe Rogan, he's a podcaster now. Yeah. He is not a guy who's very committed. First of all, he only does one fight a month now. Uh, because they have so many cards, and he doesn't want to travel. He's got a, He's got his stand-up gigs. He's got his podcast that is now a full-time job. I mean, that podcast, by the way, is one of the biggest podcasts of all time and gets some of the best numbers that you'll ever see as far as podcasts are concerned. And he's constantly, constantly got g- groundbreaking guests. I mean, he had Robert Downey Jr. on a couple weeks ago. He's got some of the biggest stars in the world on his podcast, and he doesn't really like traveling to do these gigs anymore last week during the hooker and um uh the hooker and felder fight he didn't even travel to do the gig he did a fight companion which is essentially a podcast where they're watching the the fights live and they're doing a podcast and and that's something that i think you know i was trying to i was trying to push us to be able to do it but the problem is you know there's a lot of tough it's it's tough to do that like he the only way he can get away with that is not by not using audio or video and well, this this last one actually particularly he uh he kind of mentioned some of the things yeah. that you're talking about right now yeah uh, uh, specifically about about being biased yeah uh, he, he brought that up where you know he you know he obviously does have it's a hard bias, it's hard it's not hard, to yeah it's hard not to and he, he brought that up and in his uh, defense yeah he has a lot of things going on but um, he's such a he is a good presenter no he's, he's a good talker it, you know he does a good job the problem with him is that first of all he's been doing this since the 90s people don't realize that he was the first like literally one of the first guys he actually the reason why he got the job was he actually went as a fan because yeah. he loved UFC so much and Dana and the Fertitta brothers and these guys that ran the UFC, which is Zufa at the time and Zufa is still the part of it. But Zufa at the time saw Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan was a stand-up comic, already an actor. He was in news radio and some of these other things. I don't think Fear Factor had come yet. Um, and, and essentially they said, wow, this guy's uh, very well-spoken. 
and let's be honest, he's still well spoken. The problem is he's just so off base sometimes. Yeah, you know, you're listening to him in that right Reyes fight. He's talking about Dominic Reyes as if he's throwing jabs at John Jones, and this dude's hitting him with haymakers and and rocking John at some point. And let's be honest, I'll give credit to where credit's due. John has a chin. He he took a couple shots that fight that you didn't think he'd make it through, and he made it through. The problem is Joe Rogan has been consistently there was also the the Khabib fight a lot of people were complaining about the Khabib Connor fight that he was you know almost like it was a promo for Connor and oh my god he's back and he's going to take over MMA again and next thing you know you know you have Khabib absolutely dominate this dude um and 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 make him look bad i mean let's be honest Connor didn't look good in that and it took a long time to repair Connor's image it took him you know having easy fights with Cerrone and now apparently it's Justin Gaethje. Um, I'm not, but, but I'm like not I opposed said, to that. But, yeah, yeah, but like I said, dude, as far as as far as Rogan's concerned, mm -hmm. when he went up to Bay and was like, "Oh, what a great win for you, Valentina!" Well, now I feel like there's no one left for you in the division. Why would you ask would you her that, that question? Yeah. When she just came off a fresh, dominating win with your dumb ass, yeah. dude. I can't stand Joe Rogan. And then he when brought he up the and then he brought up the newness thing when she's already said plenty of times she wants to defend her title. Like, stop telling me to fight newness. That newness fight is going to happen eventually. But dude, leave it alone. Like, leave it's, it it's, alone. It's not something that's happening right now. And all I'll say is the the whole Joe Rogan thing. I, I'm gonna make a bold prediction here. I'm going to say by this time in 2021, Joe Rogan will not be a commentator for UFC anymore. Thank any God. Um, I, I think he, Thank his, God. his podcast has grown too large. He's grown too much as a brand name. I mean, people are writing about this guy every single second of the day for one thing he's done. Every time he farts, he gets a new article written about him. Uh, I think they're grooming Paul Felder. I think they're grooming DC. I think they're grooming, uh, what's the other dude, uh, the other California kid? Um, not your Dominic, right. Dominic, oh. Dominic uh, Cruz. Cruz. Yeah. Um, they've they've groomed a couple of guys so far, and the guys who are doing this card as well. Um, I want to say uh, one of them. They're both English dudes. Oh, Dan Hardy uh, and some of uh, that that other British dude who we were listening to last week. It's always I, I am not Michael Bisping. No, it's not Michael. Oh. Well, Bisping is actually doing it right now, and that's another guy they're grooming. But the the play the play by play is very good, and there's something about British accents. You can get away with pretty much anything, and it'll be it'll be funny. Um, even you know the only the only accent that really you know you can you can hear it and just go wow. Wow, you know, you, 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 we're speaking the same language, but we're not. You know, like you, we're literally both speaking English, and you sound nothing like me. <laughs> and I don't know what you're saying. Um, and oh. and and by the way, with the Joe Rogan thing, uh, to put a, to put a nice little bow on the Joe Rogan thing, he doesn't need to do this anymore. He's like he is. I, I want to venture to say he's a billionaire by now. I mean, his his videos alone make him hundreds of thousands of dollars. Those YouTube videos make him hundreds of thousands of dollars. Facts. He does. I mean, come on, dude. Do the math on it. Not, uh, a, not a billionaire. I mean, okay. First of all, uh, the 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 stuff he makes on the road is a couple hundred thousand a month on the road. So if you're doing the math on that, he's been working for 25 years. You know, he's got to be up there right now. He's got to be definitely up there. Couple, yeah. He's got to be at, in the 700, 800 million dollar range, dude. There's no like I said, if you're making I mean, he's getting hundreds of thousands of dollars on some of his YouTube videos with the views and the comments and everything. It's not even that. It's the ad spaces, right? It's the ad the ad blocks. He's, he's getting very that, well off. Yeah, he's he's doing fine, which means, you know, at this point, and he's got a family too, dude. He's got daughters. Like, he's got young kids. He doesn't need to travel. He doesn't need to do the UFC anything anymore. Uh, and you can even see right now, we're watching the ESPN Plus coverage. Kamaro Usman and Anthony uh, Lionheart Smith are doing the thing with Karen Bryant, who I love. Karen Bryant's also amazing. Um... Yeah, they're grooming current fighters into this now. It used to be you want former fighters. Now you want current fighters who still have their, you know, their their wits about them. Bisping is about the only guy who's still eloquent, and the guy has one eye, a, a half an eye and a half a brain left, and he can still do what he's doing. Right, so, right. Um, you know, it's other guys like I said, the Randy Couture's. Uh, you know, honestly, Eve Edwards. Eve Edwards is very good with PFL. The problem is nobody watches PFL yet, and and it's going to take a little while for for these. 
brands to come up. Um, but again, Davison Figueiredo uh, wins against Joseph Benavidez. Uh, so again, no no result here technically. You get the win, but you don't get the win because you're not going to get the title. Um, I, I I will venture to say that dirt after the fight, he had said something along the lines of maybe let's do a rematch or let's you know give me a shot. As this is when Benavidez almost uh, got caught in an arm triangle, arm arm bar. Um, Benavides was taking some nice shots before, but that headbutt really had a, a big effect on him. He got split open right away. Oh, my God. Figueiredo got caught. What a nice chin on Figueiredo. His round two is when everything went wrong for uh, Benavides. As goes in right away, you start to start to see the blood gushing. A second one right after then, and then boom, the blood comes, and Figueiredo starts hitting him. And oh, my <laughs> God. That right hand Drops is like a sack of potatoes. And uh, Benavides was not complaining on the way up because he knew he was donezo. Bing. Oh, my goodness. That is nasty. Uh, and uh, Davison Figueiredo, without a doubt right now, looks like the, uh, uh, the the biggest flyweight contender. But, again, we're, we're not going to see anybody in there because uh, apparently the UFC wants nothing to do with the division. The UFC is a couple a, li- a couple years behind the times right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, they've, got, they've got to figure out uh, what they want to do. Dana White... As much as I clown Dana White sometimes, I also usually credit him when he does good things. And one thing he did talk about how was how the UFC was a little out of touch last year, that the, the, the fighters were very out of tune with the actual UFC, and they weren't as fighter-friendly as they were known to be. And by the way, there was a couple of free agents this year, Sergio Pettis, um, uh, well, what's his name uh, in, in Bellator, um, Gegard Mousasi, had a chance to go to the UFC and basically said, no, nah, we're good. Like The UFC doesn't value fighters like Bellator does or PFL does. So we're going to see the UFC sort of get humbled a little bit in the next couple of years. Uh, they've got to figure out a way how to kind of get back in, in the in the uh, in the conversation because now they're just pushing money fights um, and and it's it's not really working. No, it is not. All right, what's uh, as far as uh, as far as the um, the baseball previews? We've still got some time here to do it. I think next week we should what? You want to start with the NL West next week? Yeah, we'll start with the NL West. Okay, we'll start with the. We'll NL get West. that out of the way. We're gonna get the entire National League out of the way because it's boring as piss. And I <laughs> like as the, well. We're also gonna have uh, Mike uh, stopping by to talk a little bit and uh, a few. Okay. Is that okay? I, I we I we've like ran out of things to talk about to be quite honest. That's that's yeah. basically the only reason why I said it. I you know it, it is a kind of a slow time this year too because this is usually when we're studying up on the on the combine and then also still getting in some spring training. So uh, there's really not a lot not a lot going on. I mean, if anything, uh, you know, you could you could carry the WWE conversation, but I don't I don't watch WWE unfortunately. So. I mean, I mean the the what you call it was on the uh, Super Show was. Thursday. Okay. I caught some of it while was, was I was that working. Between Raw and SmackDown? Was yeah, that, dude. Okay. All right, cause so all right, so su- the super show is the show that they do in um in uh, Saudi Arabia. Oh, they went, they went, they went back. back. Oh yeah. wow. Yeah, you know, Vince McMahon's not can't get enough of that money, of that Saudi money. Three hundred and fifty million dollar payday check. He needs some bread to make up for whatever's going on in the XFL. You notice we really don't talk money. XFL here in the in, in on the show just for some fact of like I said, I have to be free to watch the XFL. Yeah. First of all, I'm not claiming no allegiance to any team that's in the XFL. I'm I'm not going that far. I'm not gonna sit here and be like, you not know ready what? To take on a team. No. Hell no. <laughs> no. I would rather sit here and tell you that I'm a fan of NYCFC and 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 mean it than sit here and be like, oh, you know, I really like the New York Guardians. Dude, who gives a crap? You know, so, now, now that you bring it up, um, I, I read something because there was uh, there was a game earlier this uh, uh, this today in Bundesliga, which is the Premier League in Germany. Right. And it was uh, F- Bayern, Bayern Munich, which is the they're like the biggest team in, in all of Germany versus I think it was Hertha. And um, it was six to nothing. And the the hearth of fans unfurled a banner that said something derogatory towards the other owner, um, and the players walked off the pitch. And then they walked off the pitch twice. And then after that, when they came back out for the last 13 minutes of the game, both teams agreed that they would just kick the ball between them. So it's six to nothing, Bayern. There's 13 minutes left in the game, and everybody's just huddled up in the middle of the field talking to each other 
arms around each other and kicking the ball around for the last 13 minutes of the game, apparently in protest of, of what these fans are doing. There's a big, big issue right now with racism in, in football. Um, a lot of black players are getting harassed um, on a daily basis when it comes to uh, Europe. You know, people don't understand that uh, racism is not an American only thing. No, hell uh, no. It's not an American born thing. Uh, people just, uh, you know, like to recognize America more for for racism. But uh, racism is very much alive, especially in, in, you know, some parts of Europe where, you know, there's a lot of right wing fervor about, you know, you know, the migrants and the Arabs and the brown people coming in. And, uh, and it, you know, in Italy, it gets ugly. They throw bananas on the pitch for the black players. Uh, it's pretty nasty. And and FIFA is trying to do something about it, but what can you do, dude? Like these, these are fans who are racist motherfuckers who basically the only reason why they're going to the games is to be racist and you know letting black players know that they don't give a shit about them. And at the end of the day, the black players have said that they would walk off the pitch, but dude, at the end of the day, you know they also understand that these are not the majority of people, right? These right. are a, 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 a very a very loud minority of people who ruined it for the rest. And again, we saw it today with the Bayern. Munich game and Byron I thought did a great job of basically saying these are our fans but we don't agree with them and again they they striked in protest but the reason why I brought it up is simply because you talked about sort of the the, the New York, uh, you know, the allegiance thing and, you know, being able to pick your team on a whim. And there's a big thing right now around um, uh, German football because they're mad that Red Bull. So Red Bull has done this for years and they did it with New York, the New York Red Bulls. Right. Essentially, they go and buy these teams and buy it to put Red Bull in the name. You can't officially do that. You can't officially name the team uh, Red Bull. But let's f say, for example, in Belgium, no, it's not Belgium, it's, um, it, no, it is. It's Belgium. They have RB Salzburg, but they don't name it Red Bull Salzburg. It's just RB Salzburg. Uh, similar with uh, with Leipzig in uh, in Germany, RB Leipzig. R a lot of fans are mad because Red Bull's pumping hundreds of million dollars into these teams, and uh, they're not really they're not really formulating football teams. They're just buying players. So uh, a lot of a lot of people are a little bit upset about that. As we have uh, the one and only Mike of Reps. Thanks for joining us again. Let's uh, let's get some let's get some audio for for my man Mike. Um, <laughs> Can we turn turn me up turn in the headphones? Turn me up in the headphones player. area. Uh, Mike, what's going on? Uh, can you hear me now? Check, no, check. I can't hear you. Let's let's. Uh, oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Ah. Say something. How about now? Turn up a little bit. A little bit. Turn me up in my headphones. Oops, sorry guys. Turn oh, my headphones up. Sorry about that, guys. No, you're it's right. like that episode of the Boondocks when Granddad <laughs> went to go diss uh, 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 Thugnificent. No, seriously, and he was I like, can't hear. And he was like, he's like, hey, can you turn me up in the headphones player? And he was like, Granddad, it's only going. He's all like, oh, shut up, boy. That's <laughs> my show. Boondocks, one of the best shows of all time. It was one of the best. What I missed tonight. Well, we talked. Uh, we talked a little little baseball. We talked uh, the CBA. Mm -hmm. We talked about Michael Thomas being highly upset that Tony Romo's making more money than 90% of the e e NFL. Tony deserves it. He, uh, the, he's the best analyst out there. He's the best out there. Is he $17 million a year worth it, though? I mean, that's more than, No, I think you know. he's, he's, they're paying for his brand now, right? I mean, Yeah, and he has gotten a little bit of a cult following yeah. of, of people loving. And let's be honest, CBS does a good job. I mean, the whole him and Jim Nance do an okay job with each other. The problem is the... The timing of it is just when the NFL is negotiating their CBA, which is kind of bad timing for Tony. I feel bad for the guy uh, because get your check. But at the same time, uh, Michael Thomas has a legitimate you know, thought process on that. Yeah. Right. Oh, I didn't know the details. I just knew that he got paid. Yeah, he so. got paid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. then and then players were pissed because again they're negotiating the CBA, and, and you're like, dude, getting, this guy's getting paid more than ninety percent of the league, and 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 I want to say he's getting paid more than Michael Thomas because Michael Thomas is one of the highest paid uh, uh, wide receivers ever, and I, I want to say he doesn't make seventeen million a year. I mean, he might. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. If he should. does, it's close. Yeah. yeah. If he does, it's close. Did we talk about the White Sox and the hot spring training? Yet? We did. We did. Yeah. We talked about how. 
uh, Robert uh. and uh, Jimenez both home runs uh, today, and you know it's it's looking good so far. But you know it's spring training. It, it's not even the exciting part of spring training yet. No, it's no. you know you still got the low A ball guys that are uh, starting. You haven't even I don't think Giolito anybody in the rotation has got to start quite yet. I've watched a few innings here and there, but I just feel like. It's a different – they've got a different feel as a team sure. right now. And these are split team games, yeah. too, where you've got guys who will never see the uh, you know majors this year uh, playing. Uh, but there's also, you know, in another week and a half, two weeks, there's going to be a lot of questions that the White Sox need to have answered at second base with Nick Madrigal. Uh, they need to figure out what's going to happen in, in the outfield. They're short, sort of short. They're short. They, the, 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 uh, the expanded roster is now 26 uh, players now, and the – the White Sox aren't quite sure about who their 26th guy will be. So, you know, there's a race there for second base. I'm hoping it'll be Nick Madrigal. But at the same time, you don't want to rush guys just because your window's open right now. Uh, let Nick Madrigal develop in the minors. And, you know, we let's be honest, we could use a leadoff hitter here, yeah, right? Because, sure. you know, Tim Anderson, he's a fast guy, but he's not a leadoff hitter. Yoan Moncada is almost too good to be hitting leadoff. And then Robert... I feel bad for the kid, Robert, because everyone, because of the hype around him now, they're going to expect him to be a superstar right sure. away, and that's tough to do, especially for a guy who's, let's be honest, he's killed every single level of A-ball, yeah. but this is a different game in the majors. If you've watched it, I just feel like they've bought into something, and I don't even know if they know what they've bought into sure, yet, Sure. Yeah. but it just feels different watching the first you know, 10 days Absolutely. right yeah. now. There's something. We talked about how Renteria has something to do with that. Yeah. It's not even necessarily that he's the best manager in the world, right? It's the fact that players want to play for him. They play hard for him. There was the meme last year of, you know, RB, hashtag RBDQ. Ricky's boys don't quit because after, after inning six – no matter how many runs they're down, they're going to come back and they're going to find a way to, to get back in the conversation. And this year, they're not going to be down a lot. Times. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to this year. Very. We both talked about how this is probably the most excited we've been for baseball in quite a while. But uh, no, we want to get your opinion on, on, the, on the wrestling stuff because we've got a lot of you know our listeners who are big into wrestling. Uh, we should still have a couple that are hanging around. And if not, they'll, they'll listen to this later. But uh, Nick, you wanted to talk a little about the gold. With I think we were talking about the Goldberg stuff. Uh, obviously, Goldberg uh, uh, took the strap from, uh, from the fiend, the fiend, Ray Wyatt. Yeah, and everyone's like, "Oh, he, they made the fiend look like a uh, look like uh, look look weak." I mean, well, they did the same thing to Brock Lesnar that's been going around beasting everybody else too. So, I mean, yeah. you know, my, here's my thing. My my thing is, everyone's like, "Ah, oh, this is why I watch AEW." Well. Isn't Chris Jericho 49? He's, yeah, you got a 49 year old champ. <laughs> and he's got 49. Oh, by the way, ROH has PCO that's over 50 years old. So it's not like Vince McMahon's the only guy out here bringing out these old champions to bring them back. Because maybe simply put, these young guys aren't ready yet. Yeah. Like, no offense. What was so exciting about The Fiend being Universal Champion? I don't think it was. I think it's. It was the first time they've had a creative character in a long time that wasn't a tattooed, steroid kind of guy. Right. Think of, I mean, you know, we talk about this all the time. The Golden Era was just character after character after character. Mm. Everybody had a nickname. We, we, I feel like we talk about this once a month, the same shit. Right. So The Fiend was a unique to the recent writing. Like, it was definitely a different storyline, but, uh, but then it just did the same thing every week with him. And right. Was, yeah. Lights off, come out, put somebody in a hold that if you can't get out of that hold, you shouldn't be wrestling. Right. It, the, get your get your hand out of my mouth, you know? Mouth. Like, yeah, I was going to say, put the mic up. It fell. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, like Nick and I had shared a few texts saying, uh, you know, they bitch when they... And they get what they want. Oh, here, and shoot! Then, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, bring it yeah, up right and now. Then, yeah. And then they get what they want, and then they bitch. So then you get Goldberg, you get two squash, three squash matches as your three main events. Last year they gave you what you wanted. Kofi wins the WWE title and had a great run. Seth defeated the Beast for the title twice, and women main event with Becky, well, Becky, Becky leading the way, and you still bitch. Yeah. So now you get Goldberg because Vince is tired of you. It's basically what it is. And then where's the lie, dude? Yeah. Like, where's the lie? Like, like okay. And it wasn't even so much that Becky won it because there was a lot of people saying, oh, Ronda should have won it because Ronda this and that. I don't think Ronda was that great. Like, she was she was okay at best. Her promo skills were getting better. 
But here's where here's where I'm starting to get tired of is when I turn on Raw and Becky Lynch comes out and just drops a Triple H like promo where it's just 10 minutes and it went absolutely nowhere she comes out against Asuka and she's bitching and moaning about how she's never beaten Asuka before and it's the same promo for 10 minutes for a month straight and I'd rather listen to Asuka I think she's smoking hot anyway <laughs> but I would rather listen to Asuka drop that Japanese all day before I have to listen to What's her name? Drop another ten minute boring ass going nowhere promo. And and her soon to be husband starting to do the same shit. Like, here's what I don't understand about Seth. You're making Seth become this Monday night messiah, and you're telling me that the best title you could have put on him was a tag team title with Buddy Murphy. You could have put them same titles on AOP. Then you could have made Buddy Murphy. The United States champ when you suspended what's his name? Yeah. On Andrade. Yeah. And then somewhere down the line, I don't know, how about WrestleMania? Have Seth Rollins somehow cheat Brock Lesnar for him for the to become the WWE champ? And that stable might mean something? I don't understand it, man. I don't understand it. I feel like the idea is there and they're like, okay, so we got to this point, so what do we do? Uh, uh do you think they don't want to seem too predictable? I mean, but they're not surprising us with anything on the right. other side either. I mean, they're really not. I mean, right now everyone's like, "Oh, the match between Goldberg and Roman Reigns is gonna suck." Maybe it won't suck. That's gonna be the battle of the spears. Like, what else are they gonna do? They're gonna go back yeah, and forth. Spears, <laughs> spears, punches, and jackhammer. Uh, that's all it's gonna be. It's all it's gonna be because think about it. If you kept the strap, so I was asking this question earlier to to this one girl that I work with, who's a diehard wrestling fan. If you're bringing back John Cena. There's already been rumors that The Fiend and John Cena are going to wrestle at WrestleMania. You keep the strap on The Fiend. Are you going to let John Cena break Ric Flair's record at WrestleMania 36? Mm. Are you ready for him to finally break that record? And this could be John Cena's farewell goodbye gift is being the universal champion for SmackDown for however long he wants to go before he's ready to go. Right. I think we've talked about that before, too, but I don't think Cena wants to take that from Rick, but I think Vince wants him to. I think he does, too. Um, so they're in the Triple H has to somehow get them on the same page. But. And there and there, and there's a lot of wrestling fans that, that at this point can't wait for Triple H to take over. Because NXT is such a great show right now. Yeah. It's a great show. It's, it's exactly what it should be. Maybe Adam Cole drops a promo. It's five minutes. We're straight into wrestling. You know what I'm saying? And with Adam Cole being an NXT champ, he's putting on a lot of good five-star matches or five-star S matches. Um, a lot of it right now is just straight wrestling, maybe a small promo, back to more wrestling. <clears throat> You'll get Charlotte Flair going against Rhea Ripley, which I think is complete genius. Yep. You know, it's a step outside of the box. I think that's genius. And then you get back to more wrestling, where on the Monday night show, it's three hours of 80% promos, 20% wrestling. You know, the Lana and Lashley thing has gone nowhere. It's stupid. It was a good start. Like, it, right. It could have done something, but Rusev's so, seemingly soft now. Like He went from the Bulgarian brute to the Bulgarian bitch in a matter <laughs> it's of... It's nothing. So I yeah. am... Honestly, I haven't watched in probably six weeks. So Andrade got suspended. What did they do with the title? They kept it on him. Wow. You get uh, what I'm saying? I, I, that was the last one I watched. He got injured, so he's been out for a month. I got you. They, right. I thought they could have done a tournament there. They could, anything. Or, or I don't know, you keep pushing him against Humberto Carrillo, so why don't you just give the title on Carrillo and then him and Angel uh, Garza that are fighting or wrestling each other right now I don't know. Here's a great idea. Could have been a great match for either the Super Show or the Elimination Chamber that's coming up. You see what I'm saying? That doesn't make sense because what do you say? Okay, so I was thinking about this. When we when we were growing up watching wrestling, I'm, and I'm going back to the golden era. Forget the attitude. I'm going to the golden era. 
the Intercontinental Championship was either one of two things. Either it was A, letting everyone know that you were probably next in line for a world championship, or it was saying that you are pretty much the king of the mid cards. I, growing up, I always thought it was the lightweight belt without being called that. Right. Right. Because the belt was on Hogan, you know, and then Andre, and the big boy, like physical big boy. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I right. thought it was, uh, to me, the Intercontinental belt was always for the smaller group of guys. Right. So, and it may not be wrong, but, you know, I agree with you. You, you, you see what I'm yeah, saying? they were next. But now, and, and, even, and even, in, even in WCW, if you think about it, sometimes the United States Championship in NWA slash WCW was the same way. Because, remember, <clears throat> Lex Luger is like the black card carrier of the United States title for a long time before they finally dropped the title on him and then when rick flair left wcw to go to the wwf they put the title on lex luger and try to make him a heel and that was a complete joke and but the united states title was kind of that either you were the the king of the mid cards or you were next in line for a world title shot so if you're so i'm assuming that if we fast forward to today the Intercontinental Championship is basically just the king of the mid cards, or the United States title is supposed to be the king of the mid cards. What does that say now about the United States Championship that you would take it off your main flagship show and keep it on a guy which, since the internet runs rampant on everything, you know he got suspended. Put it on Carrillo and, and continue that legacy of the belt because that's something that if you're not going to have Brock defend the title on Raw, which I totally agree with because it's not like Hogan defended the world championship every time he was on Superstars or the Warrior defended the world championship when he was champ for the few months that he was on. It never happened. So when everyone bitches and cries, it's like, oh, hey, Brock Lesnar only defends the title. He's only on Raw for this, this, and this, and this. And this dude this isn't the attitude era right you got away with that with the attitude era but if you actually sit down and broke down the attitude era you would also notice that you were almost getting the same recycled match for then us to have to pay forty dollars of a pay-per-view for a main event we've seen recycled three times on raw mm -hmm. so by not having brock come out every week to defend the, the wwe championship i guess is what he has now it's actually more genius than, than you think because you got to get out of the attitude era and realize that vince actually went almost back to the golden era yeah. when he told everybody that look you don't have to always have your champion on every single week the, and, the attitude era was unsustainable the way that they were working the wrestlers too, mm -hmm. like you saw wrestlers literally die as a result of of some of that, uh, you know, the Chris Benoit's and and some of the, you know, again we talked about how it would be like the pay per view on Sunday, you're wrestling on Sunday night, then the next morning you're you're in a different city and you're wrestling on Raw, and then you know back when they they still had SmackDown uh, as a part of the the whole thing and they didn't separate it, you were fighting on Thursdays too, so you know it. It, it's it's not sustainable and and like you said you almost have to usher in a little bit of a new kind of normal yeah but everybody thinks they should have the info ahead of time now so there's no suspense anyway and yeah the, not, I, I hear the whole script uh you know the leaking of the of the storylines is getting to be but again you know that that to me shows a fan base that is invested into what you're doing and you should almost be flattered by the fact that people are leaking this and but but the problem is that the too loose you know if it's loose enough where you can have it leaked you know that's your problem that's yeah. your problem they guess the real like at nobody knew edge was or when he was coming they right secretly they rolled him in the back door of the rumble and yeah, so that was cool it was trying well it almost <laughs> well think about it, it almost got them in trouble because when Batista won the Royal Rumble, he was supposed to be a surprise entrant. And then somebody blew the whistle when they did a show in England. And then they had to bring him out earlier than they wanted to. And then someone really dropped the ball when that was the year that Roman Reigns should have been over. And they screwed it up by letting Batista win the Royal Rumble instead of 
you know, maybe going into the creative rooms like, okay, guys, we got to redo this script now because we can't let Roman Reigns not win this Royal Rumble when he's so over with the fans right now. Yeah. You know, we can't just get because they gave that to Batista and they booed the piss out of him to a point to where you couldn't even write anything legit. They had to make that a triple threat match because they knew that I forget who even the champ was at the time. I think it was John Cena. You, we've seen Batista take on Cena before. There's no chemistry there. No. Like, just that's just as bad as when they tried to uh, when when Randy Orton won the Royal Rumble when John Cena was champ, and everyone was moaning and groaning because they're like, dude, the last few times that John Cena's wrestled Randy Orton, they have no chemistry together. They're both really garbage together. So they ended up either somehow making Randy Orton not wrestle in that main event, or they somehow took the strap off John Cena. I, f I forget how it worked, but I'm saying, I'm saying, I don't know, man. I, it's Like you said, with Edge, we knew he was coming back. We didn't know when, and he ended up coming back at the, at, at the Royal Rumble. But I like what they've done with that angle, believe it or not, instead of drawing it out for the next three months, you let you let Orton take out Edge, let him grab more nuclear heat that he already got from doing the concerto on Edge, then lays Edge to gather up his cardio. Now, after Elimination Chamber, or I'm pretty sure it'll restart at Elimination Chamber, somehow Edge gets Orton, then you can build that up to make it a really good match at WrestleMania. Right. And that's the way to do a it. A three-week build-up, not an eight-week build-up. Yes, right. you yeah. don't need the eight-week build Right. You don't need a you know, you don't need the eight-week build-up. Then you're gonna do something at Elimination Chamber to build it up some more. So what do you do? <clears throat> Matt Hardy's fixing to quit WWE. So let Randy Orton beat the crap out of him. <coughs> Excuse me, because he's going to be gone anyway. So it's like, oh, you beat up my friend Edge because we had so many classic matches when we Hardy Boys versus Edge and Christian. So you beat the hell out of him. So then Edge comes back to beat the hell out of you, and it makes a great storyline. And that's kind of what kind of what we're missing. So here's what I'm saying: first, if it's going to be Goldberg versus Roman Reigns at WrestleMania, I'm for it as long as the match isn't more than five minutes. Yeah. Because it's not it's not the main event. So if if Roman Reigns versus Goldberg is your first match of the night, because you know that Brock versus Drew is the headliner match, I'm all for it as long as it's not longer than seven minutes. It's and I, we we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier when we when we first came in. Brock Lesnar kind of pissed me off because let me make sure I got this straight. When you're building up gender versus Brock. Brock Lesnar goes to Vince McMahon and says, I don't want to do this match because I don't think it draws money with Jinder Mahal. Which, here's the only thing that I think Brock Lesnar should have been worried about. Was that if I beat up Jinder Mahal, will it make me face? Because people hated Jinder Mahal. Nobody in the WWE wanted Jinder Mahal to be the WWE champion. It was such which a blatant is, push to get the Indian audience and the Asian audience. Yeah. Bingo, exactly. <clears throat> but with that said, is think about the last time the WWE slash F had a real heel champion. You almost have to go all the way back when Sergeant Slaughter turned his back on the on the USA yep. to join the Iraqi troops <laughs> during Desert Storm and beat the Ultimate Warrior for the champ. That was a nuclear heat champion. Yeah. That's almost as far. So when you put a title on Jinder Mahal, which nobody in the WWE universe likes, it's the last real nuclear heat champion we had. That's the only thing you're worried about. So when you go to uh, Vince and you say, oh, well, I don't think that I want to wrestle this match because it doesn't uh, generate any money. Then you turn around and you put the strap on AJ Styles. So now AJ has to wrestle Brock. You only took two weeks on a storyline that you almost built six weeks prior yeah. to build up to get into the show anyway. So, but then Brock Lesnar thinks it's okay for you to wrestle Ricochet? Who in their right mind thought that Brock Lesnar was gonna lose to Ricochet? Yeah, that was that was clearly like a like a like a sideshow stunt type type uh, <coughs> side match. It's it's 
Brock's turn to put McIntyre over. Yes. Okay. But you know, Cena did it for Brock. Was it ten years ago when yeah. when Brock did fifteen German suplexes to That's Cena, right. yeah. and the match was over in three minutes. Yes. And Cena had zero offense in that. And that was it. That was, it, was on some. It was SummerSlam uh, many years uh, ago. Yeah. yeah. So eight nine years ago, whatever it was. So now it's the Drew Brock match. Um, it's it'll be the first time I'm looking forward to an actual title match for. Two big guys, yep. two athletic guys. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, the Ricochet, I mean, they're they're just trying to showcase some of the new guys and some of the old guys. But, again, my problem with Showdown, like we talked earlier, was your three main events were seven minutes long total. It, yeah. Like, as a group, they were seven. They, and, and with well, AJ Styles, the he, Undertaker didn't even hit him with the tombstone. He never gets smoked like that. Like no. On one no. choke slam and you're out. No. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, but I'm looking forward to some WrestleMania. Looking forward to some WrestleMania with, I think there's a chance to make the Edge Orton match good. I think so too. So you got your, but what what kind of build up is Goldberg going to be involved with in the next seven weeks? Mm-hmm. Like he he's not around every week. No. So you're not beating each other up with chairs for seven weeks from like like other guys are going to do and. I don't know. I just. I mean, Brock every once in a while has come out and F5 Drew when he's not looking. Perfect. Oh, once in a while. Great. Th- that's all you need. Or you do what you've been doing, tease that he might come out, but let Heyman drop a promo. Because we all know Paul Heyman still has the juice. Yeah. So we let him drop the promo. That's all you need. That's all you need. You 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 don't want to overdo the storyline. By the time you get there, you're bored with it. You can't wait right. for it to and be over with. So has Drew <coughs> has Drew gotten to Brock at all yet? No. Since the Rumble, no. no. So he'll get his chance once or twice, but methodically because that's his character, right? And then it should it should be a good you know 15 minute brawl, and and he'll kick him a couple times, and it'll be over. And and let me and I want to say this too. I I really hope that the WWE at some point puts the money in the bank match back at WrestleMania and not make it its own pay per view because some of the classic moments that we had is you win the money in the bank the first night, and then the first you, match, and the you, very first match, right? And then you can come in later in the night and bingo. You know, Rollins, and, Rollins did it. Lesnar did it. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they did. So. I hope that they bring that back. I would rather them bring that back to make a whole Money in the Bank pay-per-view match. I think the only time it made sense was in Chicago when CM Punk was leaving and John Cena was champ. And I swear of all the cities that that I, I can tell that booze the piss out of John Cena the worst, I swear Chicago is in the top two. <laughs> That's how much they love They punk. are in the top two. Because, well, obviously they were going to boo the hell out of him for Money in the Bank because yeah. CM Punk is Chicago. Right. But I've been to other shows with John Cena's out there, and I swear to God, Chicago boos the hell out of him. Mm. And some, uh, you know, Mish does the show, yeah. And Wrestling he's soup. and he asked me one day, he's like, "Yo, Nick, did you go to the show the other night?" I was like, "Yeah." He was like, "How bad were the boos for John Cena?" And I was like, "They were really bad. Like he was trying to cut a promo, and yeah. you couldn't hear nothing but a rage of boos in the all." There's a difference between booing a heel. Because he's a bad guy and booing someone you just don't want to talk about anymore. Right, and and, and that's what John. And that's where was. Batista was a couple years ago, yep. and that's where Cena's at most of the time. Yeah, except last night when it was in Boston. But you know, but it, Mish, but Mish was saying that through the TV, that it, you could tell it was a mixed crowd. They, yeah, right. Where there was both. there were some cheers and some boos. I was like, no, bro. There were ninety percent booze. Wow. Them ten percent of cheers were girls that think John Cena's hot <laughs> yeah. and kids. Yeah, yeah, that's kids, all yeah. it was. And that's that was the whole John Cena thing, right? It was pandering to the kids and you know the hip, you know hip hop, you know this white guy who, who's you know but in let, tune, but you know. the doctor of thugonomics. <laughs> exactly. And, but yeah. that's why they're thinking that them bringing. Are uh, they're pairing up the fiend with John Cena? A lot of people are looking forward to it because they're saying that since what did the fiend make Daniel Bryan go back the way he was, and then I forget who he wrestled before that made him go back to the way they were. 
Does John Cena now go from the Fruity Pebble shirts to back <laughs> that, to being the Doctor of Thugonomics, dropping freestyles on the free over hang, uh, uh, that silly comb over haircut oh, too? He looks ridiculous. He looks right ridiculous. Now. He looks like a, a, a soccer he dad. Like, he looks like a human version of Fred Flintstone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he looks as vanilla as it gets yeah. with that with I, that comb over. I, I uh, he's got the comb over in the new Fast Ten or whatever. Yeah, it's called. Exa- yeah, and and he's. He's trying to do the rock thing, right? We talked about this in yes. previous shows. Yes. He's trying to do the rock thing. Rock set this mold that almost he set the bar too high, right? Because he came in, remember, he had that like five year stretch where he did movies that nobody ever saw. He did like movies that were just shit after Scorpion. shit. Scorpion King. And then he did the one with his daughter and then the football dad that's in the meme. What was that? The uh, game plan. The or game whatever. plan. And he has that one that's that that turned into a meme. And then slowly but surely you started to see him sort of boost his profile on social media then he's in the fast franchise and next thing you know the rock is like for president now like you know he's the biggest guy in the, in the country yeah, one of the one of the highest paid, i think uh, you know actors of any movies and yeah. and he's constant like this dude if this dude isn't working 365 days a year well, it's like re- 360 days and a he's year. got a ridiculous social media game. oh his presence is crazy presence i mean is he could open up he opened up his own tequila and they jumped the charts within 10 weeks or something like that because of his, his social media his presence brand, alone man, but ballers on hbo yeah, is an amazing yeah. show he does a great job on that and he's earned the respect of like sports teams uh sports franchises oh, yeah. too ufc loves him he did the whole Masvidal, uh, Nate Diaz, BMF thing, uh, and John Cena, and and let's be honest, like Dave Bautista's trying that. He's been, you know, he he tried it with the uh, with the uh, Ga- Guardians of the Galaxy franchise, yeah, right, and people right, liked right. him in there. He was actually pretty he good in the. Very he's good funny in, in those movies, he and uh, but The Rock set a pretty high bar. I don't know if John Cena's there quite yet. Yeah, Cena, I think needs. I think Cena should beat Flair's record, and I think the reason. Let me ask you this question: Do you think Vince wants him to? Take Flair's record because John's been a five-star character his whole life. He's not Loyal, the drunk. He's yeah. not the alcoholic. Sure, he's sure. not the the troubled person that Flair's become because of his drinking. Sure. Who's, he's got a stain on his name now, where Cena's been five-star family make-a-wish Never guy. Had an like, incident. yeah, like yeah. I think that's why Vince wants him. You might be right about that. And just to put the tag of this is the greatest because he's been the greatest for our company. Sure. You know? Right. Sure. Flair he's been did. a company man for sure. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and, he and, had- and think about it like this, the WWE or more or less Vince has been low key doing that a lot. Okay. Demolition had were the longest reigning champions by day. And then they let the new day take over that. And then there was another one where, uh, like when Hogan got in trouble with that whole inward nonsense, and they took him out. They took like they he was the they longest, wiped him was out of website, WWE Network. Right, yeah, yeah, and he was the longest reigning champion based by days. And then I think they switched that out for uh, uh, AJ Styles. Yeah. So you're starting to see some of these guys where if they're not in line with the WWE, they're finding ways to erase those records for someone else to take over. And that's right. To your point about it, back to Andrade, I was going to say that earlier, but, you know, prove a point. You get in trouble, you're out. Yeah. Re- rewrite the story. Right. Let somebody else who is in line do it. So Set a standard. Put a, put a tournament. You, that, you know what? Hey, done. man, if you're going to get caught, you're to the back you're of the done. line, buddy. Yeah. You know, and. I don't care how far ahead your story is written and how good it is, if you can't stay out of trouble. What was the story with him? Because I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Was it steroids? They call they call it the wellness policy. Okay, now is that drugs? Is that you know? They're they're never really steroids. Yeah, steroids. You have to assume it's something because a couple of these wrestlers have been have been getting suspended over. I think Samoa Joe just got caught with it. Let's be honest. Somebody else just got suspended from it too. Is, Is steroids? You know, I understand that there's some health concerns with that, right? But we we kind of have gotten to a point where it's like, do we really need to eliminate steroids within the WWE? I, I think that's kind of unnecessary. I think it's part of the culture, but they've got to do the right thing in the public's eyes. Sure, Bingo. sure, yeah. But and, and the whole people dying early sure. and you know the, and the short Benoit lifespan. side effects. And yeah, and absolutely, so absolutely. Yeah, I think, but in the I don't think the golden era. I mean, we could probably name a handful that might have been. Yeah. You know, but look, I mean, like, clear, in, how many guys were in shape then compared to now? Right, right, right. You know, a small percentage. Right. Sure. 
Yeah. And then you look uh, at the Scott Halls who are basically like zombies on their feet, you know, yeah. can barely even function anymore. Uh, and, you know, that's not typical for, let's be honest, you know, big guys don't tend to make it very long either way, clean or not. You know, you don't see a lot of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's making it until the 70s or 80s. You know, these guys, like even the, even the, um, the Bill Russells, these guys don't, seven, feet or, seven footers don't last very long in life because yeah. it's tough to, tough to sustain that. Uh, but when you add steroids to the conversation, it also mixes uh, yeah. things up a bit. I think, I think it's just Vince McMahon don't want the feds on his ass. True, I mean, true. especially after so many years ago because now was, it's illegal had not right? been for hogan he'd be in jail yeah same thing we were talking about with the mlb earlier it, you know when sosa and mcguire and conseco were doing it was not illegal there was no illegality to it so there's nothing that you can do to really regulate that then once you start to put the illegal you can't just say okay now it's over you know we, we're starting from here uh same thing with the wwe uh even in the wwf era it was like an uh, an unspoken thing everybody was was on something whether you know back then they thought cocaine was a you know a, a performance enhancing drug and, right you know now they'll tell you that yeah, you, simple thing in baseball everyone was on coke in the 70s and 80s yeah. uh, macho man and the warrior they'll, that's your poster childs for, oh for the coke era but oh my god uh some of those, you would, you would think those promos. Some there's of those no promos, way there's no way. Been. Yeah, you, you don't do that on the natural stuff. There's no natty in. I mean, just the way that um, the Ultimate Warrior's neck looks in some of those promos is oh, like, bro, you got more blood flowing through your neck than I do in my whole body yes, right now. It scared me to watch some of his promos as a kid. <laughs> and then on top of that, again, you you know, head trauma is something that we, especially sort of our era of guys aren't quite understanding of what how serious head trauma is quite yet. We're seeing it with the CTE stuff with the NFL, but we're, we're now seeing it in soccer with dudes who only use their head like once or twice a game, and we're starting to see a trend of CTE and head yeah. problems within soccer players. Just imagine what it looks like for WWE guys. Guys yeah, banging their heads on the mat 20 times. 20 yeah. times, and then and then you're, you know, even when you're warming up, you gotta hit the mat sometimes, and you know, your, your body is taking a toll, but specifically your head, it's not meant to take that well, toll. Well, you know, that's what all Ultimately led to the death of the uh, British Bulldog. They said they said word on the street was there was a portion of the ring that they were using for a gimmick later on, mm -hmm. and it wasn't as padded as, as the the rest of the it. ring. So if he would have hit the hey, every time he kept hitting it, his back he was just literally laying on hard concrete oh on god. his back. Oh my god! It's to a point to where. Someone was like, damn, we forgot to tell Davey Boy he can't land in that spot. <laughs> oh and then God. his son was saying that his dad was taking just painkillers up the wazoo. Yeah, yeah, no. Because he, uh, his back was damn near broken, yeah. and it led to him killing himself. So, I mean, it's, it, 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 I, I just think, I think right now, like Mike said, I think the WWE is just trying to save face. Yeah. Just to get the, keep the feds off their ass and like, look, we got to clean this up. And because, you know, the, all the nonsense that happened with Chris Benoit, whether if you want to believe he did it or if it was a conspiracy or whatever the mm -hmm. situation might be, that we can't have this keep happening. So when you get guys like Andrade and Samoa Joe and I can't, I don't know why. Someone I can't else about six months ago, too. Uh, that got, that got hit the, with the wellness policy. One of the Usos, yeah. maybe? I don't know I think if it, it was, was one of them. I don't know. But. I don't remember. Yeah, but and then and then that's another thing that happened at Super Showdown. They end up putting the titles back on Miz and Morrison. That Miz was still that, Miz that was is him. still kicking, man. That went from the real world to to WWE and never never skipped a beat. And now he's banging Maurice, and they have two kids, oh and they're goodness. married. And they got that show, and you know, and, and, and Maurice is still, still smoking. smoking. High, bro. And, and I, I have and, a, I have a feeling we're gonna look back at the WWE, WWF, obviously, and uh, football and hockey. And the doctors giving handfuls of pills to these players, the same way we look at doctors in the 30s uh, saying, smoke cigarettes. Yeah. You got any test problems? Smoke cigarettes. You know, yeah. it, this is how we're going to look back at these eras because we killed guys like Chris Benoit and, and, you know, obviously the Scott Halls and some of the other guys who have early deaths. And some of these guys are less recognized. Remember some of these guys that have died over the last couple of years? You, if you're a WWE fan, you recognize them, but the average Joe doesn't, and they end up being this obscure person who died. In, in mediocrity. Yeah. Uh, did we talk about the XFL at all? 
<laughs> we did and we didn't. We okay. we we talked about our uh, our blatant disregard for uh, talking about the XFL until they do something that okay. that interests us. But have you been watching? Because honestly, we just haven't been watching. Is what it is. I've watched uh, you know maybe the equivalent of a whole game. Now, okay, okay. And off. Um. <laughs> How are the rules? Give me an idea of what you're thinking about. Because there's there's not that many, but there's some rule changes to kickoff stuff. Um, uh, it, it, does that sort of reflect through when you're watching? I think the kickoff rule has potential. I okay. think it could be tweaked a little bit but it's it definitely makes for you're gonna get a kick you're gonna get a return every time every time right yeah um and they had one that returned for a touchdown last week or something uh, like that there is some talent out there for sure i mean it's josh johnson's quarterback in one of the teams Mm -hmm. what's that pj walker is Uh, apparently cardell is cardell jones yeah so there's some talent out there uh, there was a really good receiver on new york today i can't remember his name six six kind of calvin johnson style wow but a little bit, even a little taller than him, and it's. I think it's it's not as much of a gimmick and as a joke. It was 15 years sure, ago, so sure. I think they're taking it more seriously. So I think it's, I think it's going to get some legs under it, and I, I do, just because there is some actual talent. They're not making a joke with all the nicknames, and, right, right, and this yeah. and that. But the uh, extra point rules, it's quirky, but it's got some potential. You can go for one point. Yeah, from the two yard line, you can go for two points. From I the like five, that. Yeah, or you can, I think it's five points from the ten or three yeah, points, three like points yeah. from yeah. the ten, which is which is good. It, it makes it makes it I, a little bit easier to come back. But again, do we really want to tweak the game that much? Yeah. You know, I, I, th- I mean, I think that's good for the XFL. Yeah, the it's NFL not gonna, can't adopt that. Yeah, but the somehow the kickoff, kickoff thing rule, might, yeah, might, might have potential. But uh, but you know what? Let me say this because I was having this conversation. You know who might be who. Okay, there's one organization, I think, that hopes to God that the XFL folds. And that's the biggest pimp organization in all of sports, which is the NCAA. (laughs) Because the XFL, Oliver Luck, Andrew Luck's father, came out and said, he's like, look. We can be the We can be the uh, the bridge that you're looking for. Right. There are kids that are going to college that – don't want to be in college. They're just looking for a second they're, chance th- to right. get into the they're, yeah. they're in there. They're saying, okay, it's like, damn, now I got to go to college for three years, and I got to uh, fight you know, for get, my eligibility. I got to fight for yeah. my eligibility, and I could give a rat's ass less I'm not even trying score. to go to school. Yeah. So here's the XFL. You know, some five-star recruit out of high school. Doesn't want to do it. Doesn't want to do it. And they're yeah. like, look, okay, look. We'll give you fifty thousand dollars. You come over here. You you do your three years here. You're still gonna get paid. You just where you have to play football. You still have tape uh, and to you show still have NFL tape. teams. So when you're ready to go into the NFL and you're draft eligible, hey, here's your tape. Here's everything. So you they're know. the the minor leagues. Minor leagues. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And 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 somewhere the NCAA is sweating. And we talked about them being a little bit of a guinea pig for the league, too. Trying out some of these rules. You know, similar to what they did with the, um, I always forget, what, is it, the, what was the uh, AFL, uh, the Alliance Football AF. League. Um, you know, they tried the whole guinea pig thing. But the problem with the AFL was financial, right? Yeah. And now we know it's not a problem for the XFL. I mean, dude, they're on ABC on Saturday mornings yeah. uh, and afternoons. And we talked about how ESPN is pushing XFL like it's the next big thing. And that's not because ESPN believes in it. It's because Vince McMahon is coming up with that paper and saying yeah. listen he knows let's be honest say what you want about vince he understands these games right oh, yeah. he understands the tv game and and what is needed for him to push this league my big thing is the the legitimacy comes with time you have to prove to me as a fan that i should uh, i should follow and uh i think they've done a good job of that so far because they brought on a lot of people who were casual at first and then they started to watch that game and then oh my god there's a game on the next day and then oh my god there's a game on next week and maybe they're getting the attention of some fans who we talked about this last week I thought they went a little bit too soon after the Super Bowl. They went the next week after the Super Bowl. If they would have just waited a month, that would have been the perfect sweet spot where people were going, I miss football now. And you know what? The the combine can only get me so excited about football. It was too soon after the Super Bowl. But but when does the season end? Uh, The XFL season? Is it April or May? I don't know. I don't know. I'll look it up. Championship in May. But. I was going to say because you you have to be careful running into the NFL draft. Yeah. Maybe I think they were thinking, uh, 
you know, there are these little things that happen in our season that we don't want it to overlap. And I yeah. think I think the draft was one of them. Let's, yeah, uh, so it's still April 26th. Uh, April uh, okay. 18th is and the playoffs. And the draft is about, um, what, end of, end of, end of May? It, it's, it looks like their playoffs will basically line up with the NFL draft, okay. which which is actually pretty good timing. Let's, but at the, at the end of the day, you could have, you know, could have squeezed that in. Yeah, so let's, I think, be realistic. If the XFL gets out of this season, it's a win, right? If they, absolutely. If the second they make it to playing, a, yeah, absolutely. Now let me tell you this. Let me ask you this. If they get to the second season and people start doing fantasy drafts with XFL, it's good. They're already it's doing good. it too. You know, it's I pretty have, crazy. Yeah, yeah it's I haven't seen it. But if people that do NFL fantasy teams, if they if if that same casual fan mm-hmm. starts drafting for an XFL fantasy team, anytime you get betting involved with it, people I mean, will I'm just follow. Saying, yeah. Oh, I'll do it. I don't know anybody. Just give me a roster list. I'll draft. I'll and draft, guess yeah. what? Now I'm going to watch. Exactly. So I, I'm invested in this. Now thing. Yeah. I think that's all they have. I think there's got to be some point of their business plan that says, get us to a second season yeah. and start promote a, it, it's promoting gonna fantasy take, team. It's going to take like a Yahoo or an ESPN to say, you know what? That season they had last year got a lot of eyes and, on it. And I think Yahoo's the one. That's is, jump yeah, first. I was going to say Yahoo is always open to that. They've been open to it with um, like prop betting type stuff too. Uh, and the ex- let's be honest, there's an appetite for betting in America all year long. Sure. You know, we have people betting in Vegas about the the coin flips and and pretty much you know who you know we have it in MMA. Uh, uh, Bruce Buffer, if he gives you a fist bump or not, uh, is he going to fist bump John Jones this time? You know, <laughs> we there's any any so, sort of thing that you can think of to bet on. We, we're betting on, and now with the laxing of the rules around gambling and the league starting to embrace the gambling aspect. Let's remember. 20 years ago, that was sort of the unspoken thing. You didn't want to talk about why sports was so big. It was because of gambling in this country, and gambling is such a – sports gambling in specific. It, you know, it's like horse racing and stuff like that. It, it's it's like you don't even have to be knowledgeable about it. I just know that I, there's going to be action here, and I'm going to put I my money down. I want to be a part of the action. Yeah. Uh, I hear you. All right, boys. I like it. You guys have been talking a long time. No, appreciate you. Uh, thanks again for, for uh, having us here, guys. Again, we're at Reps 3200 Kirchhoff in Rolling Meadows. I talked about the wonderful uh, uh, Girl Scout uh, saleswomen out there. Um, and, uh, yeah, anything anything we can plug for uh, for Reps coming up, uh, uh, let us know. Here, um, Mike. I have a question, too. Are you doing that rocking in the park again th- this year like you did last year? Last year, that was for our one-year anniversary. Okay. That okay. was in the middle of June. This year, we're doing something else. And uh, how about I announce it the next time you guys come Beautiful. Out? Okay, Beautiful. cool. But Beautiful. coming up soon, we're getting ready for March Madness. I mean, that's our... Oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. No, yeah. That first weekend, that Thursday through Sunday is really good for us. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Plenty, of, plenty of space in the bar. Get here early. Take the day off. And... Uh, Maybe you guys want to broadcast here live. Uh, that would be know, awesome. I'd love days. to, man. Uh, yeah. We'll have to set it up. I was just actually out there getting a drink, and I was talking. I ran into Jeremy Balick of, uh, what is it? City uh, Limits, Harley. That's correct. Uh, he said that there's something coming up. That's at the end of May. That is a giant burger challenge fundraiser for the vets for Memorial Day weekend. Oh, With cool. Nine Line Foundation. Nine Line Foundation is, uh, so this came to us. A couple of local high schools, and I want to go back to high school for this reason. When shop class was when I was in there, it was, hey, drill a hole in that piece of wood. Right. Okay, you pass. Kids now at Rolling Meadows, Buffalo Grove, and Hersey, I believe, they're literally building tiny homes for vets that come back from overseas that don't have family or anywhere to stay. Wow. There is a small area outside of Savannah, Georgia, that is a community of all vets that come back, they help find them jobs. They awesome. give them houses. They live in a community. They get a medical care. And so these kids are building 18 at a time. They ship them on a semi trailer down to Savannah, Georgia, and they build it. So it, it just hit home that yeah. that's such a great thing in these kids. So we're going to do a burger challenge with some local restaurants as the center point. But all the proceeds are going to this charity, Nine Line Foundation for all these vets and to support these kids. And we're going to let these kids shine and show off a little bit. These are the, the shop kids that probably don't get much shine time at right. school or 
uh, you know, they need to be patted on the back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're they're that's an amazing. They're thing. going after school. It's not just the class. They finish. They help load the trucks. They. That's it's awesome. crazy. And, and so there's local people that are trying to get uh, two of those villages. They're called veter- They call it Veterans Village, mm-hmm. wherever they're located. Somebody's got a couple hundred acres outside of Bourbonnais. They're trying to get one down there. Okay. And then someone's got one out like towards Marengo or something. They've got some land and they're trying to get this set up. Beautiful. It takes a big, pro- it's a big process to do it. Yeah. But we said, I mean, we're, we're expecting a thousand plus people at this event. That's and awesome. It's on Saturday, May 23rd. And at, we'll have all those details. Uh, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll make sure Steve has yeah, those We'll talk details. more about that next time, plus yeah. the anniversary details. But Awesome. Yeah, and um, specifically, I had Dave Wiedersack and Jimmy Mix, which are two teachers from Rolling Meadows and Hersey uh, that are leading that for those kids. Awesome. Uh, on the local level podcast, so check yeah. that out. Beautiful. It's funny they're very mild mannered about the whole thing, but I mean, everyone I tell is like, "That's amazing." Yeah, like, and that the is teachers amazing. are they just maybe they're just so used to it; it's not sure. a big deal to them. And you they get know jaded to it. A little they bit. know they're making a difference, but yeah, to me, I want to scream from the rooftops about yeah. this thing, and this is our way of doing it. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, We'd you know, love to be a part. We're of looking. That. We're looking to give them a ten thousand dollar donation. Like that's the goal uh, that day. And, if we can get if we get a thousand people, that's not going to be a problem. So we will make sure that we uh, we get all yeah we'll get all the details to our, our people out there. Uh, we'll make sure that the next time we're at reps, we have a, a, a nice little space to talk about it again too. Uh, maybe we'll have it early in the show when we get more people in the live. Yeah. yeah. Um, but definitely, that's an awesome thing, and um, you you have to you know you have to pay attention and support things like that at our grassroots level because you know as much as people want to get into politics and stuff like that, especially like during election years, everyone's super passionate, and then yeah. the other next three or four years you don't hear a peep, peep out of them uh, this is something that you can do that doesn't have anything to do with your politics that is a good cause uh, so we'll make sure to, 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 to scream that from the rooftop I want to go help them I want to go to class absolutely these kids absolutely like, I mean these kids don't have to be doing that let's be uh, honest you know uh, we don't expect much of kids that nowadays as long as you're not getting arrested uh, I think you're you're in a good space uh, but when you whenever you have kids who have that presence of mind that type of maturity uh, that's a beautiful thing and, and that's something that we'd love to be a part of too uh, I want to support that every day I do it all day, every hour. Beautiful. All right, Mike, appreciate you again. Thank you, guys. Um, We will be back uh, at Reps, obviously, next month. We're we're making this a monthly thing, and and hopefully uh, we'll have more details for you next month on everything we just talked about. Uh, Another beautiful show in the uh, books. Uh, Thank you guys again for all the support. Do us a huge favor. We talked about it earlier in the show, but just in case you're listening on audio, if you have any sort of Apple, iTunes, anything like that, check us out on the iTunes app. Search for Mac and Black Podcast. Give us a review. Uh, say that we're handsome, that we speak great, uh, very eloquent. Um, say Ask all the nice me things. Ask for my phone number. Ask Nick for his phone number. Ask him to walk you. Flattery will get you, you need, everywhere. If you need someone to walk you to your car, this guy, I'm the telling you. The gentleman act is real, lady. No one is if getting you, past this and guy. And if you want to find out more next week about uh, Nick's experience walking that girl to the car, We'll have that for you. Or or anything like that. Tune Tune in in next week. Tune in, please, guys. All right, guys. Thank you. Another one in the books uh, for Mike and Reps. Uh, I'm the Mac part. That's the black part. Peace. Deuce.